Hey, welcome. So, um, there's been a bit of news in the whole um, Rust lawsuit thing, and I thought I should cover it today because the rest of the week I'm going to be buried in this bizarre lawsuit that is the Gwyneth Paltrow thing. And I also have some other stuff I want to talk about, so I'm going to have to make videos about that. And I don't know when I'm going to do that because sometime I have to sleep. So, um, there's been a big development at the Supreme Court in an impaired driving case, and I want to talk about it, and I guess I'm going to do that later tonight. So, um, how's everyone doing? I've got a uh, Coca-Cola here. Maybe I should have grabbed a... Uh... Oh, wait, I still got uh, still got boxed wine. Maybe I can make a, uh, a wine and Coke here. Um, I had people saying... People saying, uh, damn it, Runkle, this was in my background. I thought my speakers were shorting out because of the intro. I I needed a bit of a longer intro, so I ditched the, um, I, uh, what is it? I ditched the, uh, what do you call it, um, the old intro. Now I see I need to turn on streamer mode on my Discord because it is leaking audio. There we go. That should uh, solve that problem. Um what is it? Your Supreme Court or the U.S.? It's the U. Uh, it's my Supreme Court, so uh, not the U.S. Supreme Court. All right, so let's talk about the Rust lawsuit. Now, I should note, um, I've got some people who are really upset that I'm going to be talking about uh, Jensen Ackles today. They were in my Twitter, but so far as I can tell, they don't follow me on Twitter and they don't subscribe to the channel. So, if you're here, welcome. Um, you. You may not enjoy things because I'm going to call things as I see them, but uh, we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, you have your own Supreme Court? Yes, of course Canada has its own Supreme Court. Um, I would assume that most countries have sort of a highest level of court. Um, so, yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's have a look there. So, um, just got to bring up the... Uh, because there's been some snark, and I am like 100% there for it. So um, let's have a look. All right. So um, this is fun. Uh, and I'm just looking here. Uh, so we've got defendant's notice of withdrawal of motion to disqualify the special prosecutor under Article 3 of the New Mexico Constitution and response to the court's letter of March 20th, 2023. So, um, this one is kind of fun because um, basically what had happened is that Baldwin had brought a motion to kick off the special prosecutor. And the special prosecutor issued a public statement saying that this is complete garbage and has no merit and, you know, that they would fight it vigorously. And then they decided... Oh, wait, they've said, oh, yeah, we we think this is complete garbage and we're going to um, we're going to drop it, drop the whole thing and just, you know, leave the special prosecutor. So I'm just like. OK, that was kind of weird. I did a video where I talk about their response and I thought that was um, not favorable to the prosecution. I thought the prosecution kind of clown themselves on that one and um yeah all right now on the uh you know the ackles thing this is kind of the thing i'm a huge fan of jensen ackles but i realize he's human and can make mistakes i actually became more of a fan of him after this i watched supernatural i liked like the first 30 seasons of it but then it got into the weeds and i know it only went to 15 seasons but um you know i there was a point where i just stop watching but um the thing is is i really liked his work in it uh just the writing got a little um they kind of ran out of stuff but they still kept going on uh you know still kept going on so that wasn't his fault he was doing great work right through even through the uh where the acting was uh having trouble uh, he was amazing on the boys. He, yep, um, he does good work. All right, so let's uh, let's go. 
Alexander R. Baldwin III, by and through undersigned counsel, respectfully submits this notice withdrawing his February 7th, 2023 motion to disqualify the special prosecutor under Article 3. Now, here's the thing. You don't need to say much here. This kind of motion could literally be like a half page. Um, you know, we withdraw the motion as moot. Done. That's it. But they're not going to do that. Nope. They are going to take their opportunity to uh, do a little bit of a victory lap and to drop a little bit of snark. And quite frankly, I think they earned it. So let's uh, let's go through that. So, Mr. Baldwin further states in response to the court's March 20th, 2023 letter that he has no objection to the district attorney and a properly appointed special prosecutor handling this case jointly. Properly appointed is a fun little uh, dig there because, yeah. So now they're going to give us background. And I see uh, somebody saying billable hours. Well, um, the thing is, is that the billable hours aspect, they um, um, they didn't they don't need like billable hours. I'm sure that they like personally, I would have just sent, sent this in just with, uh, you know, with that's it. Um, I see a lot of people asking about news now, Victoria. I haven't been following that one. So send me some info if you want me to look at it, but I don't know what's going on there. Uh, there's a lot of people and it's kind of interesting, the coordination there. All right. So now they're going to go through background, which is again is, completely unnecessary that they have any background here. Um, so, oh, KL Burke, I see that. Uh, I will, we'll read this uh, in a full be bit there, but I see what you're saying about uh, the joke there. It's text, it's tough. So let's keep going here. On August 30, or 3rd, 2022, the district attorney's office announced that Andrea Reeb would join the team investigating the tragic accident that took place in October, 2021 on the set of the movie Rust. At the time, she was a candidate for the New Mexico House of Representatives. On January 31st, uh, she'd been elected and assumed office. They filed an entry of appearance that designated Representative Reeb as special prosecutor and co-counsel. Um, whoops. Uh, send me a Twitter DM is the easiest way. There's also my email address in the uh, in my about section. So. Uh, Representative Reeb has been deeply involved in the investigation and prosecution of this case. She has indicated in email correspondence to Mr. Baldwin's counsel that she was personally responsible for investigating the case and making the charging decision. This, they're getting interesting here. Uh, she has confirmed as much in television and news interviews. CEG interview by Griffin Rushton, uh, which they link, and they give us a link to that. Uh, noting that she was chosen to handle everything while uh, she was doing office duties. The government's recent discovery production reveals that Representative Reed has interviewed witnesses, taken proffers, engaged experts, and handled other important matters. So she's involved in a big way. On February 7th, uh, they moved to disqualify uh, Ms. Reed as the special prosecutor, which they keep calling her uh, Representative Reed. As he explained in the disqualification motion, her dual service as both a member of the legislature and a special prosecutor violated the separation of powers provision of the New Mexico Constitution, which states that no person charged with the exercise of powers properly belonging to one of the legislative, executive, and judicial departments shall exercise any powers properly belonging to either of the others. This basically says that you can't do more than one thing. You have to... Um, you have to pick one branch to be in. I see some people saying, is it buffering? I will, um, I'm going to turn off my uh, VPN. Hopefully that'll help. Um, like Mr. Baldwin's motion not to bind over the firearms enhancement on ex post fasto clause grounds, which the government ultimately conceded was meritorious. This is a victory lap, right? This is taking a victory lap. And as I said, they kind of earned it, right? Because they have been winning on stupid issues. And what I mean by stupid issues is that they've been winning on issues that um, shouldn't have, they shouldn't have had to win on them. Uh, so that issue was one that they shouldn't have ever had to worry about. So uh, 
The disqualification motion raised significant constitutional issues that warranted careful consideration. But in response to the motions, the government issued a series of extraordinary public statements attacking Mr. Baldwin and his counsel. They did. And I, I said that was crap. And I mean, I don't like Baldwin, but that was crap. Baldwin's right on this one. For example, immediately after Mr. Baldwin filed the disqualification motion, a spokesperson for the government told the news media that Mr. Baldwin and his lawyers can use whatever tactics they want to distract from the fact that Helena Hutchins died because of gross negligence and a reckless disregard for safety on the Rust film set, which is a disgusting statement to make, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, and they quote that. Uh, that statement raises serious questions under the New Mexico Rules of Professional Conduct, which prohibit making any extrajudicial or out-of-forum statement in a proceeding that may be tried to a jury that the lawyer knows or reasonably should know creates a clear and present danger of prejudicing the proceeding, including any opinion on the guilt or innocence of a defendant. You know what they're doing here, folks. Um, they are setting the stage for an application to have this thrown out. Um, that's, they're building, um, they're building a case to have this, like, um, just tossed entirely. So that is, um, that's going to be interesting because that's coming. I see, uh, hello from Singapore. Love your, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow coverage. Thank you very much. And uh, Happy Hogue is back. We all are. So, I mean, I could see them uh, trying to uh, uh, trying to bring a, a mistrial application with prejudice. Um, this is a funny one. I <laughs> Whoops, missed that. Uh, hey, Runkle, if you were thinking of a 20-digit number, what would it be? It would be secret. <laughs> that's what I would be uh, thinking. Uh, but <laughs> that's a reference to uh, a giveaway I'm doing on my other channel, Roll of Law which uh, where there is a prize of 20 silver coins. Um, so, yeah. But basically what this says is you can't try to contaminate the jury pool. You can't try to litigate this in the public eye. Um, so it's got to be done in, um, you know, this has got to be done in court. You, you fight things in court, not in the media. So the government continued to issue similar inappropriate statements even after it withdrew the firearm enhancement, including statements denigrating Mr. Baldwin's counsel with insults and falsely claiming that they had filed the motions to inflate their billable hours. Um, oh, yes, 10 coins, 10 coins. So, and they are real silver. They are not, they're not chocolate. Um, I got them right here. So... Real silver coins here. They are Canadian maples. So that's what I'm giving away 10 of these on uh, on Roll of Law. So the statements each implied Mr. Baldwin's guilt, yet none of the statements explained that the charges are merely an accusation and the defendant is presumed innocent until and unless proven guilty, as required by the rules of professional conduct. So lots of issues here on professional conduct. Um, I see bullion or archetype. These are Canadian maple coins. They are 99.99 uh, pure. So I think bullion coins is the correct answer, but I'm not certain. So, um, and just I'll cover a couple of quick things while we're sort of distracted anyway. KL Burke, you said the US Supreme Court, my Supreme Court. So I made a joke, you have your own Supreme Court. The joke didn't land, I'm Canadian. I know we have a Supreme Court in Canada. Sheesh, I'm sorry, KL Burke. And Anna, thank you very much for the membership. Much appreciated. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is interesting, right? In addition, Representative Reed made comments in television interviews that also implied Mr. Baldwin's guilt without noting the presumption of innocence and without any conceivable law enforcement justification. Uh, and they quote the special prosecutor stating that he isn't above the law and he's somebody who committed a crime and we're going to hold him to the law, hold him accountable. All of this is super, you know, super sketch, right? All right. The government's conduct represented a disregard of its ethical duties, and it has threatened Mr. Baldwin's right to a fair trial. Indeed, legal observers with diverse perspectives have criticized the government's public statements. 
I'm one of them, right? And I'm Canadian, so I'm, you know, pretty diverse in perspectives here. But um, I've come out and I've said that I don't like Baldwin in this, that I have some real concerns about this. But I've also criticized the prosecution pretty seriously. Um, as legal commentator and former federal prosecutor uh, Andrew McCarthy put it, ethical prosecutors do not denigrate the exercise of due process rights especially in a manner designed to prejudice the jury pool against the defendant. Whew. Uh, and there's another one. Uh, uh, so this is a Twitter comment that they uh, looked at. Thomas Frampton on Twitter, uh, who said, here's the New Mexico rule of professional conduct governing extrajudicial statements by prosecutors. Hard to see how a gratuitous shot at defense counsel for correctly objecting to an obviously unconstitutional charge is consistent with this. So uh, Baldwin's team is getting a great opportunity to just dunk on uh, dunk on them in the uh, in the most dramatic way here, right? So uh, they're they're properly able to throw out all of the procedural history here, but they are getting to just um, absolutely drop the hammer. On March sixth, the government filed a response to the disqualification motion. The government's principal argument was that a district attorney or special prosecutor charged with bringing criminal prosecutions in the name of the state of New Mexico does not exercise state power at all. Eight days later, Representative Reeb abruptly announces that, or announced that she was resigning as a special prosecutor in light of the pending disqualification motion. Without informing Mr. Baldwin's counsel of her decision, Representative Reeb issued yet another public statement that implied Baldwin's guilt and that again failed to note the presumption of innocence. And I you know, I called him out on that. Uh, Ian, why are you rustling something? I'm putting the coins back away. So, all right. Um, today, the New York Times reported yet another troubling development regarding the state's prosecution of this case. In a private email exchange between the district attorney and Representative Reeb, dated June 9th, 2022, Representative Reeb asked the district attorney to publicize the fact that she was working on the case in order to advance her political career. This has not been getting nearly enough news, news coverage. This is ridiculous, right? Uh, Representative Reeb wrote, at some point though, I'd like to at least get it out there that I'm assisting you as it might help in my campaign, lol. Lol indeed. Um, in response, the district attorney wrote, I'm intending to either introduce you or send it in a press release when we uh, get the investigation. Representative Reeb's prosecution of this case against Mr. Baldwin to advance her political career is a further abuse of the system and yet another violation of Mr. Baldwin's constitutional rights. Do you think that this might be why uh, they decided not to fight this out in court? That Reeb's side didn't want this stuff coming out and wanted to just like quietly make this go away. Um, Baldwin said specifically that one of the reasons why they wanted Reeb off the case was the concern that Reeb might be pushing for this on the basis of it being for political advantage. Reeb, in her own emails, confirms that. This is gross. Gross. Given Representative Reeb's resignation, which was constitutionally compelled, Mr. Baldwin withdraws the disqualification motion as moot. Again, all that they needed to say is uh, is just that it was uh, moot. Um, and is Reeb a typo? No, that's that's her name. Um, they don't mean Hannah Gutierrez Reed. They mean uh, Reeb, the special prosecutor former. Um but Mr. Baldwin does not waive his rights to raise the disqualification issue in the future or to otherwise challenge the prosecution as a whole on the grounds that the state's conduct to date, including evidence that Reeb charged the case to advance her political career, the inclusion of the unlawful firearm enhancement, the state's improper and prejudicial public statements, and Representative Reeb's principal role in the investigation and prosecution has violated Mr. Baldwin's constitutional rights. Who? 
I said that we were going to see an application to have this whole case thrown out. They're laying this. They're laying the foundation here, right? Um, so, and this is, they're quoting a case here explaining that due process requires a fair and impartial trial and that prejudice from pretrial publicity can evolve to such a degree that a fair trial is improbable. And what they're going to say here is, listen, a fair trial has become improbable not because of Baldwin's fault, but because of the prosecution's improper actions that violate the standards of, you know, prosecutorial ethics, that prosecutorial misconduct has prevented a fair trial, and therefore that the, that the trial should not go forward. Baldwin might win on this. Like, this might be enough for Baldwin to win, notwithstanding everything else. And as much as I'm not pro-Baldwin, Maybe he should. Maybe he should. Um, so, yeah. Um, stating that New Mexico courts review each of defendants' allegation of prosecutorial misconduct individually in addition to considering their cumulative effect in determining whether a due process violation exists. On March 20th, 2023, this court issued a letter inquiring whether Mr. Baldwin has an objection to the district attorney and a special prosecutor prosecuting the case together. While reserving all rights to challenge the appointment of a new special prosecutor on any other ground, Mr. Baldwin states that he does not object to the concurrent service of the district attorney and a properly appointed special prosecutor in this case. For that reason, in accordance with the court's letter, Mr. Baldwin does not intend on submit to submit further briefing on that specific question. So what does that mean? That means that they don't object to the idea of having a special prosecutor. They don't object to the notion of a special prosecutor. They're just saying it's got to be done in accordance with the law. I think Baldwin's lawyers, um, quite frankly, are doing a bang up job here. And at this stage, the prosecution seems to be just. These are all errors that were, that are completely unforced errors, right? They're completely unforced errors. There is no reason for the prosecution to have made these mistakes. And yet they have, and they seem to keep doing it. It's just, um, it's just ridiculous. So quite frankly, if I was the prosecution at this point, I would be saying, listen, I, we are on, we're on notice that we're on super, super thin ice. Um, uh, every, like I'd be sending out memos going everything. 100% needs to be above board. Check everything you do. Do not do anything stupid. But I'm impressed at Baldwin's counsel here. Uh, I'd previously said, hey, I don't know who this guy is. Does he do criminal prosecutions? Um, so far, he's laying the excellent groundwork on this um, in order to, to, you know, get this thrown out. The prosecution, through their actions, has given Baldwin an argument that he never had before. They've basically just given him ammunition. And you don't give Baldwin ammunition because you never know what could happen. God, that's such a... If this case is thrown out on this, I mean, I'm not happy with Baldwin. what Baldwin did, but I wouldn't be upset with the result. Um, it, it just seems like this is... Um, I mean, I'd be upset with it, but not at Baldwin's team, right? Baldwin's team wouldn't have done anything wrong if it gets thrown out on this. I'd be upset with the prosecution and their complete um, failure to, uh, like, this is, you know, this whole thing about, like, I'd like to get it out there and, you know, as it might help in my campaign. Completely inappropriate, completely unforced error completely ridiculous. Um, so, oh, this will be good news. My wife will be thrilled to hear this. Runkle, your brain should be delivered April 5th. Um, I don't know how I've got along this way with uh, without one, but <laughs> we're making jokes. I think it's a brain model, but uh, all right. And the pups seem to be uh, engaging in some uh, running around outside. So uh, they're fine if people are wondering. But the doggos have opinions. And I've got something in my eye. Ugh. All right. Now, we've got an additional thing. And this happened just two days ago. Um, 
this is uh, Hannah Gutierrez Reed has a position on this, and it's different than Baldwin's position. Oh man, rubbing my eyes has not been a good idea when I've been eating nuclear beans. All right, we're going to keep going, but I have, um, yeah, I have made some uh, some moves here. Uh, I've made some decisions, and I'm just going to have to live with them. All right, so defendant, Hen defendant Hannah Gutierrez Reed buying through her counsel of record, Jason Bowles of Bowles Law Firm, and Todd J. Bullion of Bullion Law Office, hereby submits her brief addressing this court's directive to brief whether the district attorney is authorized to continue as co-prosecutor after appointment of a special prosecutor and states. So um, this is, uh, is going to be interesting, right? Because she's got a different opinion. So background, in a letter to counsel dated March 20th, the court informed the parties that the state had requested that the court swear in a new special prosecutor. The court stated it had reviewed uh, the law and noted that it seems that once a special prosecutor is appointed under the statute for good cause, the special prosecutor steps in to and takes over the prosecution, thereby fulfilling the statute's purpose. Therefore, before a new special prosecutor is appointed and takes an oath, the court requests uh, the, the parties submit limited briefing, not to exceed 10 pages, to address this issue. All right, so that's why we're getting an eight-page brief. So, consistent with this court's observation, New Mexico law compels that once a special prosecutor is appointed, uh, that prosecutor takes over the case and stands in the shoes of the district attorney, who is no longer authorized to continue as co-counsel. Moreover, the record in this case demonstrates that the state cannot establish good cause for appointing a special prosecution, and therefore, the state's request to swear in a new special prosecutor should be denied. So what Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is doing here is basically saying, first of all, you can't have the DA and the special prosecutor. You've got to pick one of them. That's argument number one. Argument number two is that the, the there isn't sufficient cause to appoint a special prosecutor, and therefore it should just be the DA. And that's great because at that point, uh, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed is fighting the DA alone, who's going to have less resources. They can't, um, they can't sort of pick the best person to do this. So, yeah. So law. New Mexico's special prosecutor statute requires the state to demonstrate, why did I just do that again? Uh, that cannot prosecute the case for ethical reasons or other good cause before it may appoint a special prosecutor. Specifically, the law states that each district attorney may, when he cannot prosecute a case for ethical reasons or other good cause, appoint a practicing member of the bar of the state to act as special di assistant district attorney. Any person so appointed shall have authority to act only in the specific case or matter for which the appointment was made. An appointment and oath shall be required of special assistant DAs in substantially the same form as required for assistant district attorneys in the section. So um, basically we've got, you know, that is a section that says that if they can't prosecute the case for ethical reasons or other good cause, and good cause can be all sorts of things, right? Um, so, but there's going to be some questions as to what that means. All right. As in any case of statutory interpretation, the analysis begins with the plain language. Here, the statute's plain language states that the district attorney may appoint a special prosecutor only when the district attorney cannot prosecute a case for ethical reasons or other good cause. Now, lots of people out there are, um, you know, lots of people out there are talking about, uh, you know, the LSAT and whether or not the LSAT is relevant in the modern era and whether or not the LSAT is an appropriate means to test lawyering. Now, one of the things that I will note is that the LSAT asks a lot of questions that require you to differentiate between I may do something if, or I may do something only if, right? And those statements are actually very different statements. Um, if we're talking about uh, how you diagram those statements, if you want to understand them as sufficient and necessary conditions, those are actually the opposite. You know, that statement is actually the opposite. But it's really important that you know this, uh, that you know the difference here, because only when they cannot prosecute a case for ethical reasons or other good cause is a very important, um, very important thing there. All right. 
The legislature could have enacted a statute saying the appointment is allowed when the district attorney cannot prosecute the case without assistance for ethical reasons or good cause. So right here, they are specifically noting that distinction. This is an LSAT problem, folks. Um, so that's kind of funny to me. Uh, or the state could have a, a statute could have uh, contained additional language stating that an appointment is permitted in two uh, circumstances. When the district attorney cannot prosecute the case, as the statute reads now, or when the district attorney cannot prosecute the case without co-counsel. But the statute contains none of these terms. It states only that an appointment is permitted when the district attorney cannot prosecute the case, which by its plain terms means that the district attorney is not permitted to go counsel with a special prosecution or a prosecutor without undermining the statutory authority for the appointment in the first place. Um, interesting, right? I think that this is... Um, this is a fun one. All right. The existing case law is consistent with this interpretation. For example, in State and Surat, the New Mexico Court of Appeals had held that a properly appointed special prosecutor is given all the authority and duties of the appointing district attorney to prosecute the case for which that special prosecutor was appointed, including the authority to name another special prosecutor if unable to proceed for an ethical reason or other good cause. This actually raises a really interesting aspect because technically that last special prosecutor might have been able to appoint their own special prosecutor before leaving. So, yes. And I see, um, is it just me or do I keep hearing the dogs periodically? You do. They are, they're running, uh, running around out back. All right. The Surratt case uh, court dealt with a conflict appointment, but its language was broad and consistent with the rule that once a special prosecutor is appointed, that prosecutor takes over prosecution of the case. In relevant passages, the court stated, and we're going to read a giant quote here. Um, so somebody's saying, for this, whoop, for this European, what is the difference uh, between a special prosecutor and a district attorney anyway? Don't they serve the same prosecutorial service? They are both, um, they're both prosecutors, right? And so they're both, um, they both fill that function. But let's say, for example, that you broke into the prosecutor's office and in full view of all the prosecutors that were there, um, you murdered one of them, right? Don't do this. This is a bad idea. But let's say that this was our fact scenario. Well, then now you have a problem because all of the prosecutors have a conflict of interest. They were colleagues and friends of this person who just got murdered and their witnesses, right? Because they all saw this happen in their office. So none of those special prosecutors, like none of those district attorneys um, can actually act in that capacity, right? They'd all have an ethical conflict. And so because of that, they might have to say, we need another, um, we need another prosecutor. Somebody has to prosecute this case. It can't be any of us. So then they can pick somebody and say, you're going to do it, right? And they might pick a defense lawyer. They might pick a prosecutor from out of state. They might pick somebody, but somebody's got to do it and it can't be any of us. So, and this is a good analogy here. It's uh, like a substitute teacher. Yep. So that's what a special prosecutor is here. So pursuant to the authority granted by the New Mexico Constitution, the legislature has determined various responsibilities of the district attorney, as well as circumstances in which the district attorney may be succeeded in the exercise of these responsibilities, listing numerous instances in which others may exercise the powers of the district attorney when the district attorney is prohibited from doing so. In any capacity, such as ethical reasons, conflicts, the appearance of impropriety. Many other jurisdictions have decided that a special prosecutor steps into the shoes of the district attorney and has the same power and authority in relation to the specific case for which that spe uh, special prosecutor was appointed as the district attorney uh, would have, if not otherwise conflicted in that case. So they give they get all of the powers, right? And that's fantastic. I mean, you know, it just allows the court to function. So, and then they cite a case explaining that the state statute permitting a course to direct or permit any member of the bar to, to act in the place of a district attorney where a disqualifying conflict of interest arises allows that attorney to assume the same duties and responsibilities as those of the district attorney. When a special prosecutor is appointed, that person becomes the district attorney for that particular case 
exercising plenary power. What is plenary power? Plenary power means you have lots of power. You have full power. You have all the powers, right? Um, you don't get like half the powers. You don't get many powers. You get all the powers. So, um, yeah. The appointment of a special prosecutor to replace the district attorney in a particular matter terminates the latter's authority with respect to any further proceedings in the case. That's a key line, right? Terminates the district attorney's powers. So that means that once a special prosecutor has been appointed, the district attorney can't step in to be like, I am going to, you know, I'm going to withdraw these charges or anything else. Special prosecutor now has the power. The import of this ruling is clear. The special prosecutor statute is triggered only when the district attorney cannot act in the case. Obviously, the district attorney has no statutory authority to appoint a special prosecutor on the basis that she cannot handle the case when she is seeking to co-counsel with the special prosecutor. I don't know if I buy this. I don't know if I buy this one entirely. And I'm going to explain why, but I'll finish the, uh, you know, finish the sentence out here. The request to co-counsel undermines the statutory basis for the appointment. All right, so let's talk about this argument. Um, cannot can mean a whole bunch of different things, right? And cannot can, you know, can mean uh, various things in the sense of like, hey, um, does is it that you're unable to, like you're prevented by ethical reasons? Because you might be, you know, I might... Just as a defense lawyer, there's cases that I can't handle. So, for example, let's say somebody comes to me and um, somebody has, um, you know, stolen something out of my shed. They broke into my shed and they took something. And then they say, this guy comes to me and says, I want you to defend me. And I'm like, I, I can't, though, because that, you know, I can't because you stole from my shed. So um, at that point, I have an ethical conflict. I literally cannot be, cannot take it. And in fact, if I tried to take that file, the prosecutor would be able to say, uh, we want to bring an application. Mr. Runkle is disqualified from hearing this. He cannot hear this case, like he, or he cannot argue this case. He's disqualified and they would be right to do so. So that's the first kind of cannot. But you might also get cannot in other ways. Um, let's say the next O.J. Simpson trial happens, right? And it's going to take, you know, 60 lawyers, you know, it's going to take six lawyers. It's going to be all this, you know, this giant thing. And I'm going, I don't have enough time in my day, right? I don't have enough time. Um, I just, I can't. So um, at that point, you um, you have a bit of a problem, right? Because uh, that's a different meaning of cannot. Now, can't it would be improper for a prosecutor to to co-counsel if the reason why they were getting off record in the first place was a conflict of interest. But if the issue is just workload, that this is too big of a file for them to handle on their own without special help then it would be entirely, then it makes sense for them to co-counsel, right? Because if it's too much work, then having two lawyers makes it less work for each lawyer, right? By simple operation of even lawyer math, we can do this one. You know, all the work divided up by two people is less work for each one than if it's just one person. I, chat, tell me if I'm out of line. I, I always have to ask the chat to check my uh, lawyer math on this but uh, I feel like I'm right. An earlier opinion, State and Hollenbeck, also made clear that the district attorney must be unable to prosecute the case before a special prosecutor may be appointed. In that case, the state admitted that there was no reason the district attorney could not have prosecuted the defendant. The court therefore found that the district attorney had no authority to appoint the special prosecutor and critically reversed the defendant's conviction because the district attorney did not have the authority to appoint the special prosecutor who had handled the case. Whew. Now we're getting into spicy territory, right? Because now we're raising an issue that if the judge gets it wrong on, could result in an appeal and in a reversal. So this is basically saying, judge, the stakes on this are high. 
if you're going to allow the special prosecutor, you better be dang sure you're right because we will totally appeal this. So we will totally appeal this. Um, Philip Martin makes an excellent point here. Runkle couldn't actually be more work if one of the lawyers is exceptionally bad. Yes, I have been on that case. Um, it wasn't co It wasn't like uh, we were both representing a separate client, but um, the lawyer who's representing the other accused made things so much harder, so much worse. All right. So this is the point where I say we, uh, where we need this. Mostly because I, I wanted to, to push the button. So, um, yeah, this is, this is saying that this is serious, right? This is saying that this is uh, a big deal. In combination, these authorities stand for two relevant principles. First, a district attorney is authorized to appoint a special prosecutor only when the district attorney cannot prosecute a case for ethical reasons such as conflicts or other good cause. Now, to me, other good cause could mean this is too much work right? This is just too difficult. Um, there's, And second, if the appointment is properly made and the transfer of the district attorney's pro power to prosecute is accomplished, then the district attorney cannot co-counsel with the special prosecutor because the entire statutory basis for the appointment is that the district attorney cannot handle the case in the first place. Now, I just want to note here that um, Baldwin's counsel is not making this argument. Baldwin's counsel is not arguing this. Baldwin's counsel doesn't care. Uh, Gutierrez Reed's counsel does. So this will be really interesting to see. Uh, analysis. Uh, the state has fundamentally misunderstood the language and purpose of the statute. The statute is not designed to give district attorneys a taxpayer-funded supplemental war chest to prosecute cases involving high-profile actors or individuals adding firepower, but allowing the district attorney and her assistants to remain on the case. Instead, the statute is expressly designed to authorize the appointment of a special prosecutor to take over a case where the district attorney cannot prosecute for ethical reasons or other good cause. Here, there is neither. Now, I actually think that this is a situation where the court could potentially rule that the special prosecutor gets to step into the shoes of the ADA, but can then accept help from another lawyer who basically or from the DA and then accept help from another lawyer in the same way that the DA could have multiple lawyers on it, right? Like if you look at Rittenhouse, for example, they had multiple lawyers. There's no reason why you can't have multiple lawyers, right? So they say, first, the law is clear that the district attorney cannot serve as co-counsel with a special prosecutor because the district attorney is not authorized to appoint a special prosecutor unless she cannot handle the case. Again, I don't necessarily agree with their, you know, with their cannot. Um, I don't necessarily agree with their definition of cannot, but the judge might. So um, you see the O oh, please is a pretty simple case. The it's too much work argument holds no water. Um, maybe. I think Baldwin's going to, be able to throw a fair bit of procedural roadblocks. But we are talking like, what is it, a six-month maximum? There will, however, be a large number of witnesses. There will be a large number of experts required. This one is a, a much more complicated case than the maximum uh, suggests here. All right. The district attorney cannot have it both ways. She can't argue that she cannot prosecute the case, therefore triggering the statutory right to appoint a special prosecutor, and then assert the contradictory position that she can prosecute a case as co-counsel co with the special prosecutor. I just, like, I don't know. I, I'd have to do a ton of research to see if cannot, like, what does that include? Is that only ethical issues, or does that also include uh, workload? Second, state has not identified any ethical conflict that would prevent the district attorney from handling the case because otherwise they wouldn't want the DA to also be on it. Therefore, the state has not demonstrated authority to appoint a special prosecutor on the basis that it cannot prosecute the case for ethical reasons. Third, the state has not demonstrated that it cannot prosecute the case for other good cause. Uh, although uh, State and Hollenbeck recognize that the reason the district attorney cannot prosecute a case need not be a legal or ethical reason, 
It could be a matter of lack of resources. Oh, well, that sounds determinative. Um, the district attorney here has not demonstrated that it cannot prosecute the case because of a lack of resources. That, to me, seems like something that could be solved with just an affidavit. But um, uh, to the contrary, just as the district attorney admitted in Hollenbeck, Ms. Carmack Altways has effectively conceded that there's no reason she's unable to handle the prosecutions against Hannah Gutierrez, Reed, and Alec Baldwin. Simply put, if Ms. Uh, Carmack Altweiss is willing and able to co-counsel on this case, as she's admitted she can and wants to do, then she's unable to demonstrate that she cannot handle the case as required under the statute to trigger her right to appoint a special prosecutor. This makes no sense, this particular bit here. Um, and I'll just go back to another analogy here. Um, when my wife and I moved into our house, we had to move in a mattress. And a mattress is big and bulky. But together, my wife and I got the mattress in and got it down the stairs. So saying that together, because the two of us are able to get the mattress down the stairs, that just I could do it makes no sense whatsoever, right? Um, two people can lift a couch doesn't mean that either of the people can lift the couch on their own. That's just not sensible right? Um, so this, I think, is getting into some really weak argumentation here. And if they've already yielded that, you know, unable to prosecute can include lack of resources, then they're going to have a tough time arguing with the prosecution saying, we don't have enough resources on our own. Moreover, as a practical argument, Ms. Carmack Altweiss and the internal team from her office have proven that they can prosecute the case because they've participated fully in all aspects of the case to date. For example, among other things, she has, one, made numerous press appearances commenting on her belief in the guilt of those charged. Hmm. Yeah, I, I feel like that one deserves... You saw how, um, what is it? You saw how uh, Baldwin noted how improper that was. Um, they didn't actually specify that, but they actually, like, they here they didn't ride this quite as hard, but they did just sort of quietly slide that in there. Uh, two, signed all pleadings. Three, I mean, signing a pleading doesn't take a whole lot of work. Three, made court appearances, including without Andrea Reed present. Again, doesn't take a whole lot of work. Uh, four, argued the detention motion in Ms. Gutierrez Reed's case. Okay. Um, five, co-counseled with her district uh, deputy district attorney in the proceedings. Six, engaged in significant email exchanges with counsel about discovery and inspections of evidence. Seven, produced discovery in this case and coordinated with defense counsel regarding the transfer of files. Eight, negotiated with defense counsel regarding defendant's uh, terms of release. And nine, represented the defense counsel that she personally prepared the special prosecutor briefing herself without Reeves' assistance. The fact that the district attorney would like additional assistance in this case or thinks it would be helpful does not meet the high statutory bar of proving she cannot prosecute the case. This is going to be a an interesting fight. I'm curious as to how this one shakes out. Um, I want to... You know, I want to see this one. I'm going to see if they will televise this particular proceeding because um, I, I'm i super curious. All right. It also bears mentioning that other than the fact that high-profile actor Alec Baldwin is named as a defendant in this case, this is an involuntary manslaughter prosecution, which the district attorney's office routinely handles. How many of them are on a novel point requiring a bunch of experts as to, you know, like the standards of care on a movie set. I feel like that's unusual. So um, while it is witness intensive, to say the least, um, the legal standards are the same for any other involuntary manslaughter case. Yes, but um, it's fundamentally unfair to Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, a 25-year-old young woman just beginning her career, to face a situation where the district attorney's office is allowed to augment its staff and resources with taxpayer money allowing the district attorney to continue in this case and throw all the weight of the state and more against her merely because this is high profile and has captured the attention of the national press. Oh my God. If this argument was taken out and if it was, um, 
if this was something where we can say that it's improper uh, for the state to have more resources than the accused, oh, that would be fantastic for every accused because every accused is always outgunned by the state. Um, it's like with rare exceptions, right? Um, just about everybody is outgunned by the state uh, in terms of money. Um, you know, hey, my client who is a guy who sleeps in a cardboard box and has a meth addiction and FASD and, you know, his income is whatever people throw in a metal cup is now going up against the government and taxpayer dollars. That happens all the time, literally all the time. So I don't know that this argument is going to fly. And I also don't know, I don't know if the court is going to like, um, the notion of like, Hey, we want them to have less money for this. Like we want to make sure that they are limited as to their resources, because it would be unfair if they had, you know, the resources that they're asking for. I don't think the court's going to go for that. Um, and I mean, I like this one. Uh, we see Apple silver saying, I think the state should pay for both the prosecutor and the defense. Seems like this would be a better system, but there might be some problems with that. Um, so yeah, um, that would be especially useful since so many cases involve less privileged classes of people. Absolutely. Um, almost the entirety of criminal law is less privileged classes of people. All right. So for the above reasons, the state is prohibited from serving as co-counsel in this state with a case with a special prosecutor. Furthermore, the record de demonstrates conclusively that the state has failed to demonstrate any statutory authority to appoint a special prosecutor. In the event such a special prosecutor is appointed over Ms. Gutierrez Reed's objections, the prosecution will be unlawful under the holdings set forth in Hollenbeck. The court should therefore deny the state's request to appoint a special prosecutor or, at minimum, prohibit the district attorney or anyone from her office from serving as co-counsel with a special prosecutor. I see their argument. I don't think it's a, um, I don't know that it's necessarily going to fly, but I think it's a good, I, I mean, I don't think that it's a frivolous argument. Um, I would be inclined as the court to reject it, but um, I can't say, like, I'd have to think about it. I'd have to do research. That's my inclination, but you better believe that I would start doing um, some additional research on that. Um, so, I mean, if you can get the judge having to research and decide on that one, so then you're going to, uh, you're going to have to look at it. So, um, so they've got here, this is also unearthed a potentially troubling issue involving prior appointment of a special prosecutor referenced in Mr. Baldwin's most recent filing before the court. This is going to be a spicy footnote. Spicy footnotes are the best footnotes, uh, stated, uh, in which these prior special prosecutors stated that the district attorney's office should announce her involvement as it may help her political campaign for state representative, adding a lull at the end of the email. I would have quoted the whole thing, but just adding a lull at the end of the email is pretty entertaining. The district attorney immediately responded, saying she would announce Reeb as requested, and some months after did announce the special prosecutor's involvement, uh, Reeb won her race. This points to the fact that this case is being prosecuted because of its high-profile nature alone, which, among other things, ignores the original purpose of the Special Prosecutor Appointment Statute, allowing appointment for ethical reasons or reasons of good cause and inability to prosecute due to lack of resources. Here's the fun thing about this particular footnote. This footnote may blow up their whole argument because you know what I might be thinking if I was the or if I was the judge? And I didn't want this to be the issue, but I also didn't. So here's how I might think about handling this. I might say, listen, I might be inclined to say, okay, um, I find that the district attorney cannot prosecute this case because I find that the district attorney has created an ethical conflict by their involvement in this email issue and therefore is unable to prosecute the case, and a special prosecutor must be appointed, and the DA cannot continue on in that regard. So that kind of doesn't get Gutierrez read what she wants, because then there's the special prosecutor. 
but it also gets them half of what they want because then the DA is out of the case. And if that happens, that's entirely on the fault of the DA, and that might cure Baldwin's problem as well. So that could be where the judge decides to go on this one, is just, you know what, it's only going to be heard by a special prosecutor, and um, that's it. So fun stuff, right? All right, so this is, um, this one is a bit of a headache, and... Um, I would love to see this case prosecuted through, but there's a real possibility that it just gets thrown out. That has become a very live possibility. All right. So now we've covered the latest filings. I understand there might be another filing coming as the DA responds to that one. That'll probably be up online, I'm hoping Monday. So, uh, we might be able to respond to that as part of our Monday fun day, um, stream. And on that, I mean, I'm going to be doing a recap, but I'm also going to do just some non paltrow stuff because, um, yeah. All right. So, um, there was a trial in Saskatchewan where the judge would not let the lawyer off the file, despite, uh, so many attempts by counsel to be excused. That's happened before. If I'm the judge, am I irritated with the prosecution? You bet I am. If I'm the judge, I'm having some conversations. Um, There'll be some discussions. So there will be some real thoughts on that one. Um, here for years, asking for uh, for hints. Do the clowns have, or do the coins, I saw somebody else's comment, have Elizabeth or Charles on the reverse? Um, I don't know if this one's a hint. It looks like it's Elizabeth, but the, there's a variety of coins. So I guess one of them might have Charles. I think it's all Elizabeth II on them, so... No Charles on at this on these coins, at least that I can see. I, I can't promise for certain. So don't take that as a, a thing. I just looked at that, looked at them roughly. Sunday fun day with Runkle. Uh that looks like a smiley cat face. That's kind of cool. All right. So um whoops. Are these new coins? The coins are they're they're varied. So um yeah, their bullion ranks right up there with American Eagles. Yep, uh, from I did some research. Canadian maples are um, are sort of in good regard. Off topic, Corey is going to Whitby. I saw that um, I saw that come up uh, in my feed, but I was just about to start streaming, so I couldn't watch it. So I'm going to watch that later. All right, let's do a swoop here. That's the uh, sort of funky swoop that I've uh, settled on here. All right. Hopefully you guys are going to be able to see the odd or hear the audio. Um, I also have uh, some, I better cover some uh, gift memberships here. I think uh, Samantha Steinus. Thank you very much for the 20 gifted memberships. Brentwood Sheik, Thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. Uh, Vintage Willow. Thank you for 10 gifted memberships. Um, Lady in black is saying is how the bullets got on set being investigated. I'm sure it is. And I am sure that the um, I I'm sure that's going to be part of the case as well. That's going to be a, a major discussion. So, um, Ryanman uh, YYC, give thank you for the ten gifted memberships. And um, was it? I see that somebody saying that the DA's brief was posted the same day as HG's. I don't see the DA's brief online and on the New Mexico Courts webpage. So. Um, the press might have it. I'll have to look. I don't have it right now because it's not on the uh, the court web page where I've been looking. All right. Um, I guess let's swoop again and then we'll go to the interview. Somebody says the swoop sounds like a toilet. Please consult a plumber. All right. So let's see if I can get this to properly uh, come up on the screen. Uh, there we go. And hopefully you guys will be able to hear the audio. Can you guys hear the audio? Uh, let me know if you guys hear the audio. Maybe let's turn it up here. Okay, I see people saying yes. All right. <laughs> you got my booster. Yeah. 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 
guess all you guys gotta gotta get that done. Yeah. Did you just fly in this morning? Literally landed about forty five minutes ago. Nice. Yeah. So let's just talk a little bit about interview uh, stuff. Um, Ackles is here without a lawyer, and I would not recommend being here without a lawyer, but um, he is. Now, he's not the guy sort of on the hook at this stage. So, but he's also, I mean, I'm guessing he's got money. I'm guessing he's got the money to uh, to bring a lawyer in as well. So I would have in his shoes. Um, it is never a great idea to talk to the police without a, uh, a lawyer present, but he uh, he's doing so. Um, and I see somebody saying, who is this now? This is Jensen Ackles, uh, famously a, you know, one of the two stars of Supernatural. Uh, he was also going to be an actor on Rust. I assume he probably still is going to be an actor on Rust. Um, he is giving a police interview because they wanted to talk to him about stuff going on on the set now i mean you know you might say hey how would they come after him well let's say the police somehow decided that he um uh let's say the police somehow decided that he was responsible for you know the ammo on set or something like that uh, i don't i'm not saying he was i think there's no evidence whatsoever of that but you know the police sometimes assume weird things so um yeah I see people saying, I love how they put Dean Winchester before his actual name on the video title. Yeah, I didn't name the, the video. All right. And um, he was a producer near the area. Yep. And this is important. He was the actor that Baldwin was supposed to shoot in that scene. I kind of feel like he might have, might have some opinions, right? Um, I would certainly have some opinions. Going to uh, something? <laughs> I mean, I've, <laughs> I've I've floated some pretty sketchy runaways at yeah. the time. <laughs> that was fine. Actually, coming here for the film, I was flying uh, for the film ride. Yeah. And the only way to get here was to like drive to Montrose, Montrose to Denver, Denver to Albuquerque, drive to, and I was like, hang on, hang on. I was like, I'm sure there's some old cowboy that's got a plane that can just fly me over. <laughs> so I did, they found uh, this like little little company and I flew in this like, single prop literally next to the guy, like with the <laughs> nice all the way over and we landed. It was pretty it was pretty sketchy coming in on that one, but uh, that was fun. So this is standard rapport building. Um, they're just asking basic questions because they want to get him comfortable, get him, get him chatting, and so forth. Um, that's kind of what they're looking to do there. Now, um, you know, these questions are not super innocent in the sense that they are designed to get people talking. But you know, he's not at this stage a suspect, and he's never becoming a suspect. So yeah. Um, and I see not on the hook should have had a lawyer. Are you for real? Yes. He's, you know, he's not charged with anything, but yes, have a lawyer. If you're going to be talking to the cops, you got a, a right to have a lawyer there. Why would you not have, why would you not exercise those rights? Um, makes no sense not to. Yeah, I have uh, flown in once into the Santa Fe airport and I, Really? Like, never again. What's like, wrong with it? It's fine. I know, it wasn't fine, but I have a slight fear of flying. Okay, my, so. my wife is, is like that, too. Like she's like, she's not a big drinker, but if she's going to fly, she's like, I need shots. Just get on the plane. Well, yeah, I, I just feel like, I, when yeah, I no landed, I was like, this runway is like, not level. It's, it just seemed like a mess to me. I remember I was flying into Atlanta one, one time, and it, it was for an event that they had chartered a plane for. So it was a jet. It was a small jet. And the wind shear was so crazy that we were literally coming in like sideways. Oh, I've and had that happen too. And then at the last second, he was like, nope. When it came around and tried it again. So the second time, it was just like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Race yourself. That, was, that was pretty sketchy. That's how the, on Friday, it was so windy out here. Um, so our gate was like guest station. Yeah. And that's how all the things are coming in. They're coming in. Just coming in sideways. Yeah. Like, uh, so yes. sketchy. 
That's New Mexico weather. Yeah, when you got this, you got the big crosswinds here too. Yeah, like open plains, right? Especially not a lot of trees. Um, so let me just start with what's your, do you can spell your first name for me? J-E-N-S-E-N. -E -E last name? Ackles, A-C-K-L-E-S. What's your date of birth? 1978. Witnesses don't need a lawyer. You know how many times I've seen people who thought they were witnesses who turned into the suspect? Lots. Um, you need a lawyer. Like, you need a lawyer. Sorry. Um. And this guy can afford a lawyer. Um, I would think very carefully before I gave a witness statement, personally, because there's always risk, right? Um, being a witness places you at the scene of a crime. And if you are at the scene of a crime, then you are at risk. And I saw somebody saying, are we going to jump to specific points? Are we going to commit to the whole thing? I'm committed to the whole thing. Um, some people say I ought to be committed. But... Um, this, you know, at this stage, he comes off as fairly personable, right? And this is, um, I suspect he's quite nice to have a conversation with. So, no, you don't need a lawyer because he's done nothing wrong. People who've done nothing wrong need a lawyer. You know how many people I who have done nothing wrong I've had to defend to keep out of jail? Lots. You know how many of them are happy that they talk to the cops? None of them. If you've done nothing wrong, talk to the cops because innocent people get convicted of stuff all the time. And Kale Burke is asking an excellent question about the Canadian standard. Uh, do, can we have lawyers with us in Canada? No. Uh, you can't have a lawyer with you in questioning, which is why you should just say nothing whatsoever. Um, so, yeah. All you do is rinse and repeat your statements. You mean the statement that implicates you by putting you at the scene of the crime? That statement? Yeah. Um, get a lawyer. She probably makes me the oldest in this room. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm born in March, too. Also, Pisces. Pisces? Yeah. Heck yeah. Fish, good people. Yeah. Gemini's, not so much. Mm. <laughs> uh, two sides to you, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So what is your role or your title as far as this production goes? Uh, one of the lead actors. Okay. Any other no. secondary type things that you do? Nope. Not a similar producer as well? Nope. And I mean, I don't know, I'm sure you guys know this, but like... Post up your credentials. I, I already have a bet on this. Know, as far as so, goes, but, tell us how you know, you know more about the law. Kind of these ancillary titles to, uh, you know, it's almost like a vanity thing. Yeah. Kind of, you know, to an actor, just to like sweeten the deal so they'll sign on to become like, I I, I know that I, um, I wasn't offered a producer credit, but I was offered some producer points, which is kind of like a back end kind of thing. But it was just, it's like to sweeten the deal to, to get people to sign on to do it. Kind of like a um, co-producer? Yeah, like that, like they would offer that kind of a thing in order to get a big actor to come on. But there's zero producing uh, responsibility in that regard. So. Okay. Getting to it. Um, I've gone over, like, I'm going to go over everything. So getting to it. Chill. Uh, this is the one people wanted me to cover next. So that's why. I, I I'm not I did not have that title at all. But even if I did, I would have zero producing responsibilities. responsibilities. Yeah. Okay. Um. Let's just start with uh, the day of the incident. Were you there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you kind of go through the day? Um. The normal day. I I probably um. I have to look at the <clears throat> at the um the day out of days, which is the, essentially the schedule for the actors when what days they're working, what days they're off. Um, but I'd probably say to say that I was, I, I worked more than the other actor at that, up to that point. Uh, my storyline had, had, was kind of the heavy focus of the first part of the filming. Um, Alex's story was, uh, we were, they were about to get into his stuff and was, was going to be shooting with him primarily for the next two weeks. And I was almost done with the film. I think I had like three or four days left. So, uh, up to that point, I had been on set almost you know, the, the full time that they were filming. I think I may have, may have had a day or two off. 
Um, and uh, we had gotten into shootouts and stuff prior to this. So, you know. To- now, I just want to comment a little bit on the audio because I can hear as the officers write on their pages. You got to be aware that these rooms are rigged really well for audio. And so um, that's always uh, something you got to think about, because if you mutter something under your breath, they're going to hear you. They're going to, um, you know, if you do what Baldwin did and took a phone call, they can hear both sides of that conversation because your phone makes enough noise for them to pick it up. Uh, These things are, these rooms are always really well, um, really well sort of tracked for that. Uh, yeah, and somebody's saying, look at the acoustic paneling. Not all of them have the acoustic paneling on the wall, but yeah. I, I handled a gun almost uh, well, every day. I mean, it was part of my costume. Um, they would hand me a gun in the morning. I would check it. I would do my own checks. Um, just because I've, I've been in the industry for 25 years, I've had a lot of onset and offset training for uh, firearms. So my my quick check is if they hand it to me, they show me all of the the dummy rounds in the uh, in the wheel, and then I just take it. And armorers hate this, but I just dry fire it into the ground six times. Okay. I don't super like that either, but I do like that he checks with the like he checks with the armor in order to to verify that it is like that is one hundred percent right. Um, the dry firing, honestly, at that point, so long as you've checked it, but it is a potentially risky activity. So, um, but he does take safety seriously on this, right? He does actually say, Hey, listen, we're going to, um, we're going to actually make sure that this is, you know, that this is fine. Um, and I see people talk about this as a custodial interview. This is not a custodial interview. He can leave at any point. But, um, yeah. So, I mean, this is one way to check, but, um, yeah. And, uh, all right. That's my own personal check. They're like, oh, don't do that. It's going to hurt the firing pin. I'm like, what they mean to do. so what? Yeah. <laughs> I want to know that all of these are actual done. Not that I would. And this is a fair comment. Um, I take the gun out of his hand and give him a rubber knife for the rest of the movie. Yep. Um, You don't like if the armorer says not to do a thing, don't do the thing that the armorer said not to do. Uh, But uh, I do like that. He says, I go over the check with the armorer. That part I like. I don't like the part where he's like, the armorer says not to do this thing because it's unsafe or might damage the gun. And he does it anyway. So, uh, and somebody said, why six times? Because he's using a revolver that has six cylinders. So that's why. And if you don't know who KVB Studios is, KVB Studios is in the film armoring industry. So, yeah. Ever think that a live round would be in a gun on a set? There's there's just not a world in which a live round should ever be on a set. Correct. Which is why this is so... uh, is so like crazy to me to, to comprehend how that's, I mean, that's the big, that's all I want to know. I'm, I could walk into all the safety protocols, everything that I, I saw, everything that I went through. Uh, the, the only question I have, it's not like, Oh, how did Dave miss this? Or how did Hannah not get in? How did a live round end up on a set? Multiple rounds end up on a, on a film set. It's just, there's not a world in which that should happen. But the thing is, the problem now that, statement is actually good for Baldwin and bad for Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Um, that statement that he just made there. I can see you're going to see counsel coming back to that statement because he's he's almost certainly going to have to testify. And I mean, if you're wondering what is the cost of giving a police interview, one of the costs is that he's he's almost certainly going to uh, going to have to testify. Because now they know what he will say, and so they'll be, uh, you know, so they'll they'll bring him on there. If you look at a, you look at a dummy round, it's made to look like a live round. Mm-hmm. You look at a blank, it's crimped, has no tip. It clearly looks like a blank, but that is a charge in it. So you're looking for a, a, a clay tip that is 
to look like a lead tip or a crimped tip, which is a charge bullet, or not a bullet, sorry, a charge round. Um, if I look into the gun and I see six clay tips, then I can just assume that they're all dummies because that's all that should ever be on a set. If I see a crimp tip, then I'm like, whoa, whoa, we got a hot gun here. Like that's, yeah. There's a blank in there. Get that out of there. Um, which is why I just, I, I feel for Dave because I feel like he could have looked at it, given it a visual inspection and, so, and saw six clay tips and not known that one was a lead tip yeah. with a charge in it. And that there might be enough to help. Uh, I mean, this is, again, great for Baldwin. Um, so, yeah. Now, I, I disagree that that's sufficient to just look at the tips, especially because on that kind of revolver, you're not going to be able to see all six rounds without actually turning the cylinder. But, um, yeah. Um, but again, so there was clearly safety protocol that was, that was skipped or missed because... It should have been caught. Every round that's loaded into a gun is should be inspected and can be inspected. Yeah. Um, and anyway, if you're wondering what the watermark is, this is uh, who posted yeah, this online. But, I don't know. Uh, you tell me if you just like, you know, if you need me to like move on or something. No, no, I, no, I'm, no. I'm, I'm, I haven't really talked about this since it happened. Okay. So I'm kind of going through this too. I mean, I've, I've tried to talk to my wife about it, but she's, it kind of freaks her out. Yeah. And she gets pretty, uh, anxious about it and she's like i can't i can't she you know she's like if i'm watching the news she's like please turn that off please turn that off right it's, it's a traumatic situation <laughs> it is yeah no uh, kidding for us that were there and for people that were that are you know in proximity <laughs> so uh that day that particular day morning went uh per usual um we were uh we were shooting up at the church uh actually we shot some other stuff uh the morning of we had a slight delay in the morning in fact so much so that we got loaded up yep. into a van at base camp and we're headed to set and they said and they turned the van around they were like wait we're not ready for you turn like everybody go back to base camp to the cast and i heard that on the radio i was like what the fuck like that's that's weird like if maybe they had a camera uh a lens issue or or the light wasn't right, but at least bring us up there. It's not going to be, a, it's going to be a 10 minute fix, whatever it is. <laughs> Little did I know that it was the camera crew that was walking because they weren't, they weren't. Uh, yes, it is. I mean, this is, this is what I heard that morning from the producers. I think this uh, was like a couple like, weeks after. Yo, what's happening? And they were like, a camera is yes. walking because we won't put them up. We put them up where? What do you mean? They're like, well, we're, they're set up in Albuquerque. They want to be in Santa Fe because it's a longer commute. It's less of a commute. They want they want a lesser commute. It's in the contract that they don't get that. They're still in the zone. Uh, and if we do it for them, then we have to do it for all of the departments. And we don't have that in the budget. It's a small budget movie. Uh, so they, they threatened to walk, and they walked. I was like, well, when did they threaten to the walk? They were like, this morning. They waited until like one of our busiest days when we have a big giant shootout. They knew we were just coming off a two-day break. They could have said it. They could have done it like two days prior, given them. I mean, if you're going to walk for like labor issues, of course you walk on a day that's going to cause problems, right? So, um, and this is a, a good comment here. Uh, live rounds make their way onto the set in only one manner, negligence absolutely no other method than pure stupid negligence there's a um there's a, a a legal sort of principle which is basically the thing speaks for itself res ipsa loquitur and that's basically that in some circumstances the only way a particular accident could have happened is that um is through negligence right and so if you're saying that you know, and the classic example of that is a, a warehouse where a barrel rolled out of a top floor window and struck somebody who was walking outside, right? And so um, in that case, you know, we say the thing speaks for itself in the sense that there's no way a barrel should fall out of a window other than negligence, right? Here, a live round being on a set is negligence, right? There is no way for that to happen. And other than than negligence or um, or intentional, 
right? But basically, liability will follow from that. Um, all right, let's keep going. Give the production two days to find replacements. Mm -hmm. So they did. They were smart. They're negotiating, and they showed up that morning with their equipment. They were like, "So are you gonna put us up?" The production was like, "No, we told you no." And they're like, "Okay, I." And that's why they were like, uh, "Send cast back to base camp. We don't have a camera crew right now. We gotta figure some shit out." So we went back, and, and we got like a, it was a two-hour late head start that day, which was you know, we moved pretty quick, uh, especially for a, a low-budget film like those. Those tend to be high pace. Um, so uh, once uh, B Cam uh, Reed, who was uh, Helena's uh, guy from LA, um, he wasn't going to leave her, so he he stayed, even though most people would have probably left in solitude or solidarity with their the rest of their camera crew. But so we've got A Cam B Cam. Uh, B Cam is usually a guy that can also double with steady cam. So A Cam is more studio mode. Does this make sense to you guys? Uh, they left. B cam stayed. The operator, um, the focus puller didn't. He left as well. So we lost like six out of the eight camera people. And maybe it was seven. This is already but a bad Reed scene, stayed, right? For operator. safety so reasons. So finally, they, they they wrangled some focus puller to come in uh, that more like immediately, and we were able to continue the day with one camera. And um, so we started. First couple shots, me riding into town on a horse, hopping off, establishing shots, that kind of thing. Uh, and then we, uh, and then we moved up to the church later in the later in the morning. And um, the first, uh, the first few shots inside were facing me, so it was over uh, Alec to me and my kind of deputy coming into the church, guns drawn, saying, you know. Stand up slowly, drop your weapons, that kind of thing. Um, and then he basically slowly takes his gun out, thinking that he's going to, you know, drop the weapon. And then he draws back the hammer, jumps so up, and starts shooting at me. That's the scene. So we shot my coverage. So I put it up to one and a quarter. Um, and yeah, this is Jensen Ackles. He's being interviewed, but he just sort of laid the scene as to what's going on, right? Uh, Ackles is coming in as deputy. He's saying, everybody put your guns away and that Baldwin is going to pull the gun and they're going to get into a gunfight, right? Um, over him to me, uh, both wide and both tight. And then we uh, started to turn around and broke for lunch. So we went to lunch, came back, first shot, the first uh, camera shot back was a, kind of a, a close insert of Alec Holden's gun out. And so I was standing not immediately on set because they were just setting this particular shot up. It didn't necessarily include me, but I would have been coming in for off-camera dialogue. Okay. Uh, I was not on camera, but I would have been off-camera for the, you know, telling him to put his guns down, that whole thing, which he probably didn't need me to do that, but that's just, you know, what we do. Um, so I was standing just outside the church, uh, right off the porch there, when the gun went off. Uh, and again, they were just setting up a shot of him pulling out the, the, the gun and showing him, you know, she was very, she was very kind of involved in every shot. Um, you know, this is, uh, I'm used to kind of directors being a little bit more of like, okay, I want to see this, I want to see this. But Joel was more of like, this is the scene. Elena, how are we going to shoot it? And so she was really, for all intents purposes, she was the meaning of director of photography. She was directing all of the camera shots, and she was very, very passionate and, and amazing at it. Um, but she would get right in there. Um, she would even like move me, like finding the light and stuff, just, just right. So she was very, very hands on. Some people don't do that. A lot of people don't do that. They'll just sit there, you know, share it behind the monitor, actually, like, you know, on the radio telling people to do things. But she was very hands-on, so she was standing right there next to Reed. And you looking can at tell he's got a lot of regard for the uh, on, the on the camera, um, asking Alec to show her what, you know, show me your action. So he was just showing her the action, and, and, it, and then it went off. I don't know if he was just drawing back on the hammer and his thumb slipped, and that was enough of a spring to, to get forward and hit that primer or what, but um, I'm sure he's told you. Um, now, the thing is, is you can't draw back on the hammer and have your thumb slip in a way that'll get it to fire. Um, it's just not feasible. You have to have your finger on the trigger for that to work, um, for that to happen, um, which is real easy, right? It doesn't take a whole lot of pressure on the trigger to make that, um, to make that happen. And uh, 
And so I heard the, sh the I heard the, the, the shot go off. There shouldn't have been uh, any shot go off because a it was set up. There was no, there was no cameras rolling. Rolling. Uh, there was there wasn't uh, supposed to be around uh, a blank to be shot in that particular camera sequence. Um, and nobody yelled hot gun. So when it went off, I just it just sounded different. I mean, a, a, a real round sounds different than a blank. Um, and I didn't immediately think that it was. I just was like, what the fuck was that? Real round sounds different than a blank. He's a guy who's clearly uh, clearly shot a few, right? Um, and I mean, blanks have different power levels. So, you know, they might be quarter power, half power, full power. So, yeah. Um, and I see uh, his finger was on the trigger with the slow draw takes that were released. Yep. And that's going to be something that gets, um, that's going to be mentioned in trial. That video, I can guarantee you, will be run in the trial over and over and over again. Uh, and uh, so I spun into the church. I saw Joel down screaming. I saw Elena seated. And I could see she was, her back was to me, but I could see the, the blood pooling on her, on her khaki jacket. And so I just started yelling medic. And uh, yeah, and then, then that was about it. Then I just I stood back. I was kicking myself for not running in there and doing something, but I don't know what I would have done. I mean, you know, the medics are trained professionals and there was an onset medic, so I mean. There was, that's why I was screaming for him. Uh, <clears throat> and I know that uh, as the reality started setting in, of, at first I was like, oh, somebody, you know, a, a shot went off. But there's no way that that would have caused that much damage. Like, how did, how were two people down and there's that much blood? with a movie round. Um, so I was just instantly like, like what? And then as it started to settle, I just, I was like, that was a real round. That was, I know that sound. That's a real round. Yeah. Cause that, and I mean, I, I hope he's getting some care. I hope he's getting some, uh, some treatment uh, because that's going to be hard to deal with. Right. I hope he's getting some proper, um, um, I hope he's getting some proper attention for that because uh, this is hard for anybody to deal with. But um, I mean, he was sort of lucky to have been uh, outside of the uh, the room there. That's a that's a good thing. And um, you know, when he's saying, "How did it uh, sort of go through two people?" I mean, that's that's the thing is that you get over penetration with uh, with actual rounds. So. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I hope I hope Ackles is doing all right. And I mean, one of the things that's going to be kind of crappy is that uh, I know he was big. He always went to the uh, convention circuit and so forth. And you know, he was he's really the sort of guy who would shake hands with fans and all of that. Um, and um, I I wonder, you know, somebody's going to be throwing this in his face um so yeah uh did this happen at the same time baldwin was being interviewed i think this was actually substantially after the fact um so what it sounded because you made a comment about how it sounded different to you yeah let me sound like a river sound like a 45 i have 45 i know what it sounds like okay he's got a 45 um, i you like see him <laughs> what happened with the gun after it was shot no, when I stepped in there, I saw Alex sitting seated in the pew, uh, holding just like, you know, just in, in shock. Because it's also like a flashbang, right? I mean, that thing goes off. It's everybody in there was deafened, and they were disoriented. I mean, uh, that's uh, good. When Mamie came out, who's a school supervisor, she was stumbling out, and she ended up being the one to call nine one one. There was another a wardrobe uh, person was in there. She came out. She was stumbling. She like hit her knees. Uh, Reed was still in there. Um, also good. You know, there was a few people that, that kind of staggered it's out. Pending litigation, it was, right? It was disorienting. So um, I didn't go in because the, the medics were yelling everybody out and everybody out. And Joel, the our director, was actually yelling, uh, you know, get the fuck out, get out of here. So people were quickly exiting that didn't need to be there. Um, so I didn't, I didn't go back in there because I knew it was, uh, uh, you know, I couldn't do anything at that point. So I just was good man. Back and, let, yeah, sort of let the medics take uh, care of it. Move. It's exactly the right call. To make way for uh, responders. Okay. 
out of the church. I also just want to note here, um, uh, him saying like I started moving equipment. Not, not every actor would. There was just footage released uh, just a little bit ago of Keanu Reeves helping haul equipment up the stairs, and some people were like, "Oh yeah, anybody would have done that." No, uh, lots of actors wouldn't touch that sort of thing. So. Him stepping in and actually trying to help out without getting in the way and making it about him is fantastic. Um, or uh, out of the way of the of the church, there was so much equipment around the, the front of the church, and we knew that everybody was going to need access. So we started moving barricades, we started moving camera equipment, we started moving monitors, we started, and I just, I just heavy you know, stuff. Threw my right? jacket and my hat off and started helping grip some electrics, and everybody just started moving shit. Okay. Uh, let me back up to the beginning of the day. Okay. Um, you guys working with any of the firearms on the first half of the day? Um, I mean, like I said, we get handed our, our gun belt and our uh, and our firearm in the morning, and it essentially stays on our person because it's part of our costume for the remainder of the day. Um, if we ever are actually shooting it, then it gets taken. They load it with round with, with blanks. You know, we usually are using half loads. Um, and then it's well announced that there's a live, you know, a hot gun and, you know, how many rounds are hot at what load, what capacity, uh, so that everybody's aware. Um, but again, you know, the, there's the, the few of us that are, that were in the movie, we can handle. Yeah. And somebody's asking, well, I cover the body cam. I will. Um, I'm just trying to get through things sort of as I can, when I can. Um, but yeah, this is, and there was a good question here. Uh, should you move stuff in a potential crime scene if necessary to provide medical attention? Yes. Um, I mean, that's not legal advice, but I can tell you that, you know, if you've just been shot and the EMTs arrive, the EMTs hit a crime scene like an explosion because they just, you know, they get to work, they step in the blood, they smear things around, they drag people, they drag things, they throw bits of litter around. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, they just do. It's essentially a prop, you know, um, and it has dummies because I, I always personally check and I was telling some of the other guys, I'm like, always check, always check yourself. That's not why we're hired. And I was telling you this, yeah. we're actors. And if, if actors, if it was left of the actors to be the final, like, uh, uh, line of, of safety and defense, then I wouldn't trust 99.9 people I work with, uh, for some of the people I work with. But, um, again, and the thing is, is the actor is part of the final check. Uh, the actor is, part of that like the last step on that check is the actor checking with the armor at the same like the armor should be demonstrating it and so um yeah just from from using a lot of firearms on set and also having uh real training um i just always do my own personal checks just because mm -hmm. it's a smart thing to do yeah, definitely. Yeah. Did you, or what gun did you have in the morning? I had the, uh, I had the, it's 45, uh, it's not the long cold, but it's a, um, it's the one that has. US not really Marshall, necessary. Uh, in the, uh, the not a factor. Um, I believe there were only two on set, but um, I think, I, I don't know if it was, but I was told that, that was one of the ones you guys. Uh, okay. It was mine. And did you check that in the morning? I did. I always did, yeah. Did it have anything in it? Dummies. Okay. And did you take the dummies out? Or just did a visual check? I did a visual check and did a, a click in the ground. So he checked. He can. And I also appreciate you walking us through that, you know, what what takes place during a film. Because, I mean, we're getting to know what actually takes place on film. You know, this is a major case. And some people have, that we've spoken to have kind of walked, walked us through the what the procedure is. So I appreciate you yeah. letting us know what exactly takes place. We're starting to learn a lot more about what goes on in there. Yeah, any questions that I can, you know, that I can shed light on, I can and I see somebody, it's the usual thing in the chat, somebody saying, you know, it's not his responsibility, it's the armor's responsibility. If you are taking a gun, you are also taking responsibility. Full stop. There is no circumstance where you're holding a gun and you don't have responsibility for that gun. And if you can't be a participant in that safety process or are unwilling to be a participant in that safety process, don't touch the gun. Like, just insist that your character is going to be armed with a stick of butter or something harmless. Who kind of you the gun in the morning? Um, that particular morning, I 
I believe Sarah Proft handed me my gun belt and Hannah handed me my, my gun. She, uh, she was not, not a hundred percent of the time, but most of the time, the person that was handling the firearms, uh, Sarah would help her and had a license to help her. This is something that I learned later. I just was, you know, it's like, cause I, I asked her that day and was like, did you handle the gun? And she was like, you know, I was like, are you even supposed to handle the gun? She was like, yes, I'm licensed to do it. So I would help Hannah out. Um, but for, for my recollection, uh, Hannah was, was handling the, the guns 90% of the time. Um, there were times when I would hand at lunch, we would always take our gun belts off and hand our guns back to props or, or Hannah. Um, so I would just take my whole belt off and hand it to either Hannah or Sarah, whoever was close by. And then they would, they would take it and lock it up and do whatever they did with it at lunch. And then I would get it back after lunch. Um, during your time here during the soul production, has David ever handed you a gun? Uh, no. Or anybody else? Yeah. Well, Sarah, I think as, as there were probably a couple of times where Sarah handed me, um, the gun maybe i want to say that every morning hannah would show me the rounds she would go she would uh pull the the, the wheel lock back slide a wheel then show me each round and hand it to me then I... so you know he's describing how they're handling this tana you say you carry daily you know guns would you ever accept a gun then from somebody who just told you that it's unloaded trust them point it at somebody and pull the trigger because if so, maybe I have some thoughts. But, um, yeah. Would you let him speak freely like this if you were there representing him? I would do an interview with him first, and I would be sitting there with my, um, you know, I'd be sitting there ready to tell him to stop talking if necessary. Um, and sometimes it's better to just give them, like, a pre-written statement or a statement from the lawyer. Um I would check, but I have training. Great. If you don't have the knowledge to check a gun, don't touch a gun. Like, sorry, that's just just the thing. Not a prop gun Baldwin had. It was a real gun. It was both. Props are often real objects. Like, hey, um, you know, this pen here, if it appears in a movie set, is a prop. It's also a real pen right? It's also an actual pen. So, um, I would click into the ground, clear my holster and there it stayed until lunch. Okay. Uh, blanks are not really um, reusable. Then, They're single use. Did they outfit you after lunch the day of the incident? Yes. Okay. And I can't remember if I clicked into the ground that day. So I, I mean, that, I know, I know I did that morning, but I, I've been racking my brain trying to figure out if I did my safety check after lunch and I can't remember. And maybe that's just because it was a pretty, a pretty crazy event that happened after lunch and, and i'm just trying to think of there's it's like flashes like i know where i was standing i know what i saw but for some reason i'm like gosh did i because i never overly thought about it I'm like gosh did i check my gun when i came back from lunch like i normally do i always do but i, I can't remember doing it who had to do that after lunch I can't say it was certainty. Okay. And it's okay if you don't know, because um, we don't want to say or you right. know, have something in mind that didn't happen. So if you That's what I mean. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I could certainly, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I could give a percentage guess, but it was, I, I don't know for certain that it was either Hannah or Sarah. It was one of those two. Okay. And what about your belts? They would have been the same person. Okay. Um, what did you do with it after the incident? Uh, I took it off and handed it to uh, Sarah. Okay. And she went and immediately. I saw her take it and to the cart. So let's talk a little bit about all of the danger of providing a police statement. And, you know, again, I'm not saying he did anything wrong or anything like that, but um, let's say your memory is shaky, right? Let's say your memory is, um, let's say you got some problems and you provide the police with all of these details as to what you were doing and when you were doing it and so forth. And let's say because your memory is shaky, it's you get a bunch of things wrong. Well, now the police might decide that you're a suspect because they say, hey, you got this wrong, you got that wrong, you got the other thing wrong. Maybe not as much on this one, but let's say it was a homicide, right? You know, that gets to be a bit of a <laughs> gets to be a bit of a risk. And at trial, they won't say, oh, your memory was weak. They will say you were lying, right? 
and it looks really bad to a jury, right? The problem is, is that no matter who you are, your memory is not perfect. Well, with, you know, rare exceptions, there's people with photographic memories and so forth, but most of us, most of us are people who are, you know, flawed in various ways. We can't remember perfectly. And, you know, I just recently got a call about an accident I witnessed um, some years ago. I don't remember a day. I don't remember it at all. Like, not at all. I'm trying to find notes to see if I remember it, you know, if I can refresh my memory. But right now, I just, I got nothing. So, um, yeah. Um, there's risk, right? Can you describe the cart? It's just a rolling double decker cart that has, you know, a variety of props on it. Can the color? No, blue, maybe. Blue and black. Did you see her set it down? After the incident? Yeah. No, I, I, I handed it to her and then I went to work moving equipment. Okay. I said, here, take this. And then she you know, she was frazzled. And I saw Hannah, like, on her knees, like, head in hand, like somebody was consoling her. And I was like, take this, put her in the cart. And then I just started moving. Shit. Okay. Did you see um, what happened with the gun after it was fired? Alex gun? Yeah. Uh, Dave, Dave, I mean, I heard Dave yelling, where's the gun? Where's the gun? Because he wanted to inspect it. And I don't know why Dave is, um, you know, is inspecting it. Somebody's asking if I could turn on closed captioning. Let me see if that's possible. All right. We're going to try. Um, there we go. Yeah. And trauma will not help memory uh, either. Yep. Absolutely. Kind of they were handling it. I did. I did see that. Okay. Do you, uh, pretty, can you recall what they did? Uh, they were still in the church, and I just remember them. Dave yelling, uh, "You know, where, where's the gun? Um, let me see that. Let me see that." And then I, I don't remember anything. After. I don't remember what happened after that. What was that particular situation? Okay. Going back to Hannah. Mm -hmm. um, so you've been working with her. Um, here's the thing: if if there's just been a shooting. Secure the gun, sure. Um, inspect the gun, maybe not so much. Like, yeah. Since the beginning of the set, mm -hmm. can you, or is there any other time that you witnessed that she was doing them safe and not following protocol? Um, is there anything that stuck out <clears> to <throat> you? She was, in my experience, she was saying, saying the things that uh, you know, or an armorer would, would, would and should say. Um, there were, she was doing safety checks. Um, you know, there's there's levels, yep. I think, to the intensity of, of armorers in our industry. Um, I would say that the majority that I've worked with are like drill instructors and can scare the piss out of actors when they hand them uh, any kind of weapon, whether, you know. I didn't know I could do that. supposed to be fired or not. Um, did not know. I used to not like that. Now I'm thinking that I think it's a really good thing. Um, Let's go back here. Um, there were, she was doing safety checks. Um, you know, there's, there's levels, I think, to the intensity of, of armorers in our industry. Um, I would say that the majority that I've worked with are like drill instructors and can scare the piss out of actors when they hand them uh, Good. Any kind of weapon, whether, you know, whether it's supposed to be fired or not. You should be um, taking it seriously. You should be a little I afraid of like it. That. Now I'm thinking that I think it's a really good thing. Um, so Glad yeah, you came I, I would around. Say that there wasn't that kind of intense uh, fear that she was giving off. Um, again, like most of the ones that I work with are like, very, you know, they're either military, ex-military, ex-law enforcement. They've got a, a, a long, long history of, of gun handling, gun safety, and gun training. Um, and they they do not care that you're a Hollywood actor or, or a name or anything like that. They are there to to make sure that you know that this is a firearm that can hurt people. And yes. you don't point it at anybody unless you're planning to 
to, to shoot them, you know, shoot, you know, aim it at a target, you know, because there's, there's safety guidelines. And I think that's probably why I, I do things that I do with my, with my prop. Um, it's just because I. That's one of the basic rules of safety. Do not point a gun at anything you are not willing to destroy. Um, and this is a good point here. Um, some armorers have made statements saying they would have shut down sets, take their toys and went home. Yep. Um, I, so when the Baldwin shooting happened here on, on the set, um, I had a number of people who were like, Runkle, when are you going to do a video on this? When are you going to do a video on this? When are you, and I said, when I'm ready, when I'm, when I'm damn well ready, because what I was doing was I was calling around to get more information both as to what actually happened, but also um, I wanted to expand my knowledge of film set protocols before I made, um, you know, before I I made any sort of um, notion, right? And so I wanted to go and I called a bunch of, um, I called a bunch of armors, right? And most of the armors did not like i'll say some told me not like that they wouldn't they didn't want to talk to me uh but others were like listen just so long as you're willing not to use our name uh we'll we'll chat with you um and i got people saying that they were actually kind of um happy to hear that somebody wanted to hear from them and wanted to actually get more information but um what is it like many of them said, like, listen, we would shut down production and armors described, um, you know, more than one armor described having basically recast a, an actor's role by saying this actor doesn't get to handle guns on my set. And so, um, there's movies out there and I can't name any of them because it would get the armors in trouble. But where you've got like three people with guns and one person who's a knife expert. And the reason why that guy's throwing knives is because they sucked with the guns. Now, that's not always. Sometimes that's the, you know, that's it might be that that was a decision made for various reasons. But there have been, you know, there have been mentions of people where it's like this actor doesn't get to have a gun on my set. They've been irresponsible. They've been improper. Um they just don't. And so that person suddenly is stuck with a knife in the, you know, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I see, uh, how or why is it up to the armor to shut down production? Or do you mean in the sense that they take the weapons and go home? They take the weapons and they go home. And that that just finishes it. Like at that point, you need to find a new armor because the, the armor has responsibility over those weapons, even if the weapons are actually owned by somebody else. Um, the armor has custody and responsibility of the weapons and they can take them and leave with them. And this is basically the most sacred duty of the armor. This is what the armor is partially there to do is to say, what is happening is unsafe. I'm, I'm not doing it. And there have been films that have been shut down entirely because the armor has just said, nope, we're not doing this. Or sometimes where they've had to do major changes and major um, revisions because the armorer says, you know what? Um, until some stuff changes, we're not, you know, we're not filming. So that's why the armorer has that responsibility. It's because that is their job. They are the safety person. Um, you know, it's, if you think about it in the sense of, Sometimes you got to have somebody whose job it is to hit the switch that shuts down the factory if there's been a, a you know an incident. So that's the armor's job is to hit the shut everything down switch as well as to educate people to ensure there's safe use to all of those things. Um, that is what the armors are there for. Um, it's essential. All right, so um, I see some uh, super chats here that I'll get to. Uh, uh, Ancient Maverick, thank you for the member chat. Thanks for looking at Jensen's interview. Well, no other problem. Uh, Chase P is saying, has anyone done testing on the actual gun used? Defective. Uh, they tested it. They could not get it to fire um, improperly, including testing it to failure. Uh, they actually tested it until it broke. 
Brentwood Sheik, thank you very much for the 10 gifted memberships. And Chuck Wilson, thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. Um, and uh, basically, the armor's job is to be the a-hole. Sometimes it's to say you don't get to do that, right? Uh, just joining in, what connection does Jensen Ackles have to Rust? He was He's an actor in Rust. So, uh, yep. Uh, did you get to talk to Taryn Butler at the Gundy's? Only very briefly. He was there. Um, I spoke to him really super briefly. Um, he had kind of an entourage around him, so it was kind of tough to, to chat with him. So, I've, I've been dealing with uh, armors who are very strict and very Yeah, this is nuts. And very safe. Um, I know that... Uh, you know, on, on, I was on a show for 15 years and a lot of times I would use, I would have my gun on my person, but I wasn't actually uh, firing off uh, blanks, but I would have it and I would need to, uh, you know, rack it or, or do something in the scene. Well, the armor, you don't necessarily need an armor for that. Uh, props, a props on set props person is licensed to, to handle firearms, but they're not licensed to handle ammunition. Okay. That's where that's when armor <laughs> is the specialty, the special person. They are really These responsible for closed captioning is pretty awful. Sorry, the gun folks. is a prop. The ammunition inside the gun needs a specialist. Okay. Um, and yep. so the, the, my props person, you know, on this particular project would literally come up to me and shake every bullet in front of my face and then load it. Shake because there's BBs inside, empty uh, dummy rounds. You shake it like that, you hear a little rattle, you know that it's, there's no gunpowder in there. Mm -hmm. um, and that was on this side or previous one? That was on the previous one. Okay. That never happened on this side. Um, what he's talking about is the proper method of doing this. And um, a properly made film dummy should be set up with a, a little BB inside for the dummies, right? And it's got a little BB in there so that you can tell um i've got a, a baggie of them somewhere my office is a bit of a mess right now so i might not be able to find it easily but um it's so that you can tell that these things are dummies fairly readily um, i got a set of film dummies from a film armor um and the film arm like that's where they they literally came from a film armoring company and so because of that, I was able to do a video where I took somebody who had never, ever shot a gun before. Uh, they said that they'd shot like a paintball gun and a squirt gun, but never an actual firearm. And we went to the range and blindfolded. She was able to successfully pick apart a mixed pile of ammunition that I had. Like it was a, a big pile of ammo that had uh, live rounds and dummy rounds together, stirred up together, right? So um, what he's describing is the proper process where you go and you, um, you can pull the thing out, you can shake it, and then, and that's really what you should be doing is pull, you know, if you've got a revolver with six rounds in front of the talent, the armorer should be going, this round, shake a shake a, we agree it's a dummy, great, in it goes. This round, you agree it's a dummy, great, in it goes. Baldwin didn't do that. Baldwin didn't give a damn. Baldwin, from the allegations here, you know, assuming that the allegations are correct, and again, I'm getting some concerns about the prosecution, but um, they, you know, they just didn't do it. So, um yeah, that's exactly that. Um, are there not blanks or dummies with different tells? I thought it'd be the armorer's job to teach the talent the tell for whatever they have every time. Yep. The the tell like if I'm not a movie star, right? And I will it's I can't imagine a universe in which I become a movie star. So um like let's say though that I'm on a film set and they want me to to use a gun. I'm not taking that gun until I know for certain that that gun is clear, right? Just simple, um, just clear. Um, Trent Van, I sent a grip home. A grip is sort of general labor. They help out in various ways uh, because he was concealed carrying on a set I was working, legal in the state, not breaking any laws, but not allowed on my set or any other film set. Um, he argued and he was fired properly. Yep. Uh, 
Larry M says, with that hair, you're not a movie star. If they are ever filming another like Lord of the Rings movie, I will totally try to see if I can become an extra as like background elf. I think I would make a good elf. <laughs> so, or maybe on the Witcher movies, background Witcher, if they ever have like a place where that would make sense. That being said, I, I, I don't know what what is mandatory protocol for armors. I just know what I've experienced. And I, I have experienced more safety measures in other on other sets than I experienced on this particular set. But again, I didn't feel unsafe. Okay. Um, That's bad for Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Uh, might be bad for Baldwin because Baldwin's been on a lot of film sets. And so and Baldwin has a bit of a higher responsibility because he's got um uh he's cut some uh you know production roles um i see people saying i would watch a movie just to see you elfing i suspect that there'd be a bunch of people who'd be uh curious about that uh let's look at some super chats here just while we've got a moment nicholas starro uh, uh, noting if you give me six lines written by the hand of the most honest of men i will find something in them which will hang him um uh, yeah uh don't this is basically a uh historical don't talk to the cops um ian are you going to brandon slash donuts shooting thing i am i am looking excited for it or about it so i see they are making more lord of the rings movies i gotta figure out like casting and see if i can try to you know slip in as a uh, random elf all right carrying on that was more i mean is there anything that you can point out that, you did that was really like that's not my phone. That was the officer's phone. That was like being loose or cavalier. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Um, I just know, like, me personally, I, 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 I knew she was inexperienced. I could just tell, you know. Um, I knew that she had, she, she clearly learned the lingo and through the verbiage and, and understood gun safety from, from somebody teaching her that. Um, but she knew she the lingo, also, but she's also the, the, the youngest armor I've ever even heard of. Uh, so I knew that there, you know, there was there was lack of experience there. But you know, how are you going to get experience? People don't take things from you. So I was I was cool with it. I was I was like good for you. Uh, you know, I was like good for you. Kids. Like you know, getting in there and getting jobs and in a, uh, in a predominantly male dominated uh, um, field. And there she is. Like you know, so I was kind of like stoked for. Her. Um, were you present during the, they call it the show and tell day of all the weapons? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, I, uh, yeah, it was an afternoon. It was out on the set, out on the ranch. Uh, the ranch. There was a big table set up with an array of weapons, um, handguns, long guns. Uh, and she was there with, there were boxes of, of um, flanks. And it was, it was kind of a pick out your gun day. So, you know, that was because, again, this is this was part of the character, part of the costume. It was part of that, that building character aspect. It was the same thing as, as going out and picking out our horse. You know, we spent a day out. I, in fact, I did the same. I did both those things in one day. Okay. I first went. To so what he's talking about this is basically, you know, you're you're playing a character, but you might have a little bit of control over at least when you're Jensen Ackles. Right. If you are like random, if you're going to be playing like random cow hand number 17 you get what you're given but if you're jensen ackles then they're going to you know then you're gonna get to play a little bit of a role um in kind of design of your character in this sense and so um in this case they're uh, uh in this case he's saying like what they did is they have all these guns and people get to pick one out and so, I mean, uh, Baldwin apparently picked out a, um, uh, Baldwin picked out like uh, a single action army 45, which I think is a solid choice, right? So I think this is a, a solid call. Um, so given the option, you can keep the Colt, give me a show filled. Uh, not a bad, not a bad call at all there either. So um, I see some people talking about the crow shooting uh brandon was not killed by a dummy round he was killed by the combination of the projectile from a dummy round and the impetus from a, a blank round it was 
uh, a weird freak accident. Um, hi, everyone. Just starting nervous because Supernatural was my first fandoms, but I know Ian will give it straight. I'm not here to bag on Ackles. I actually like him better as a result of this. So uh, let's keep going. The, uh, to the, the armor show and tell. Picked out my, my gun, and then I went over to the horse ranch and picked out my horse. Okay. Um, but in, in that uh, show and tell, uh, she asked me... Um, I wonder what gun he picked out. Uh, what, what level is your experience? And in, in kind of a, not a joking manner, but just kind of wanted to see where she was on the on the level, mm -hmm. I said, let's just assume not much. And so, and she she said, okay, this is how you load it. This is how we, this is how we check it. This is how you know the gun work. This is the trigger. Good. This is the handle. I'm like, okay, okay, just kind of playing dumb. And she said all the right things, um, but it was more of just kind of an explanation. Uh, I don't know. There were a lot of safety measures that were explained to me, but it was just more. Of, this is how this is what a gun is. This is how it works. Mm -hmm. And she goes, um, if this is the one you like. I'll, I'll load it up with some uh, some rounds and you can just fire it off into the hill there. I said, okay, great. These are guns. Uh, no, sorry, these are blanks. So we're not, we're not live rounds at all. Important that it's blanks. So I think yeah. we're using uh, half loads. Okay. Um, and so I put my gun belt on and I took my I took the pistol and she she took it. She walked it out to this you know uh, to the firing line, uh, heavy stand with facing downrange, uh, and then she. She loaded in uh, a full barrel, a full uh, full wheel, six shots of uh, half loads. So I took it, uh, put it in my holster, and then uh, <laughs> kind of a dick thing for me to do. But I did like a quick draw and just <laughs> spun it and put it back in. <laughs> the whole cowboy thing? Full on. Yeah. Full on. Show did, off. Did, even did the spin. Spun She's the gun. Like, well, she just goes, okay, asshole. Like, <laughs> you could have told me that you knew how to handle it. Um, and so we laughed at that. And then she basically was like, you're good. Get out of here. Give me your gun. So <laughs> I like that story. Um, so yeah, um, that's kind of uh, a neat, neat thing there. Um, uh, yeah, it's blanks, but you can still kill somebody with a blank, but it's still kind of, I don't think he did anything unsafe there because he was expected to fire the blanks, but yeah, it is kind of, uh, useful there. Uh, Peter, um, shoot me a DM on Twitter just to sort of say what you're looking for. Cause, uh, yeah. Um, I feel like this guy would be great to go for a beer with. <laughs> Anyone else get the same feeling? I'm never going to get the opportunity, but it would be pretty awesome. Oh, when you guys happened. went down to do the practice shots, was it just solo? Did you guys have any other people with you? There were, yeah, there was a whole group of people. There was, uh, uh, there was a couple producers there. There was, uh, props was now, I'll just note here, this is correct. Checking a single action army is not as simple as opening a cylinder. It is as similar or simple as pull to half cock, open the loading gate, spin the cylinder. Um, and if you need to, then you can, you know, then you can unload it. Um, but I mean, the thing is, is that you can tell the the dummies from blanks or from live cartridges by the primer. Um, so that is something to, uh, you know, I was able to check with film dummies as to whether or not they actually had live cartridges in them in a second, like literally just click. That's it. That's it. So, um, yeah, uh, it's fairly quick. Um, he owns a brewery restaurant in Austin. Seriously? Austin, Texas. I'm going to be in Texas. I might have to, I might have to go check that uh, brewery restaurant out. Cause um, yeah. Um, that thing with the revolver, is that called fanning the hammer? Fanning the hammer is you hold the trigger down and you, you know, you, yeah. So um, I'm going to have to look this up folks. Jensen Ackles brewery. Um I would not be able to, um, I, you know, there'd be no way I could ask him any questions about this, but, um, I, I would have to go check that out because, um, that would be cool. Um, go to his brewery and look for his car, baby. You got to keep it when supernatural shut down. It was in his contract. I bet he's not, I mean, rust is filming, right? So I don't think he's going to be there, 
but I think it might be pretty cool to go check that out and um, just, you know, maybe I'll film and film just having a beer. Um, that is super cool. There, uh, Sarah and uh, I can't remember the other, her assistant. I can't remember her name. Um, she was there. Uh, Hannah was there. Uh, but when you went down to shoot. When, oh, I, when I went to, to fire down range, there was I was the only person. Everybody else was behind me at the tables. Okay. So we stepped out around. I, I stepped around the table, walked out probably a good ten paces, and then aimed away from everybody. They were all like six. Okay. Um, who was watching the guns while she would take? While she was with me, mm -hmm. props. Okay. And what about the ammo? That would have been all sitting right there in front of them on the table. Nobody was touching anything. Okay. Do you recall on the table what the you know the rounds the blanks were in? What color? I might box? have to go to Austin. <laughs> Uh, no, I want to say I saw a white tray, oh, with, man. you know, like a 50 That's round uh, tray of, of rounds. Um, I know that she had a variety because she did, she did say that, uh, she was like, you want to start with quarter loads or you want to do half loads. And, and I think I said, let's go full loads. And she's like, no, we don't have full loads. Those are too expensive. And I was like, oh, low budget films. <laughs> <laughs> Cause full loads are just funner. You know, they're, they're more fun. They just have a bigger blast, but they're also more concussive. Yeah. <laughs> And did you watch anybody else go and practice with Hannah? Um, I kind of came in. Uh, there were a couple of actors there. Uh, picking out their, their stuff as well. I don't think I saw anybody. I saw uh, Travis shot one. Travis Femmel was there. And he, I think he popped off one round and was like, all right, I'm good. And, but he's, he's also somebody who's got a lot of training. Okay. I clearly knew, uh, knew he was somebody who was comfortable, who was comfortable around, around weapons. Okay. Um, See that I thought was interesting. Um, where it was like, Hey, um, did he know, like he fires off one and then he's done that to me says that you've got either somebody who is very experienced and they're like, I fired one and, um, and, you know, Oh, I don't want to touch it anymore. Or, um, fired one and it's like, yeah, I'm good. I've done this thousands of times. So, um, says something when I trust Ackles more than the armor, I suspect Ackles could probably armor it. So, um, yeah, um, I, I might actually, so, uh, Stacy Walpole, if you're interested in hunting or long range shooting, I left you links in discord role of law when you were at the Gundy's. I'm going to be back in the Texas area uh, fairly soon, so I may have to figure that out. Um, Some of the other guys I, I, I think weren't, uh, hadn't had much, uh, a lot of experience. Um, some of the actors, you know, guns can be scary for people who don't, who aren't comfortable. Same thing with like a horse. That is true. You know, I, I was seeing the same thing with the horses that I was with the weapons. I'd be you know, more so afraid of the like, horses, to be honest. Oh my gosh, it knows that I'm scared. Why is it doing, why is it, why is it turning? Of course it is. You know, and it's like, because it knows you're scared. Yeah, it can feel the fear through your legs. Um, you know, I could, I could tell the way that people were handling some of their, their, their guns too, that they just were, it was awkward. Okay. Um, but again, uh, I never felt the need to like speak up and be like, put, not your, following put your fucking gun down. Yeah. You know, don't point it, don't point it at me. Were you there when um, Alec was doing? I did not see him. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know that the gun was there because somebody went to pick that and they were like, no, 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 that one's, that one's Alex. Okay. We're saving that one for Alex. Okay. Was the, was the what about any he wanted to pick the cool gun and they already had it picked out for, uh, for Alex. Uh, Rust is in Montana in April. Don't know dates, but uh, Alec Baldwin will have to be in Santa Fe, New Mexico for two weeks starting uh, in May, uh, bearing court rescheduling. Yep. Um, so... Jensen was actually at the brewery last weekend for the Crawfish Boil, so he was there, family business brewery. It's really nice. I am, I'm totally thinking I gotta, I gotta book there. I see they've got an official family membership that is, uh, that sounds really cool. But um, yeah, I, I, that's, uh, that's probably out of my price range. That's a hot grand. So um, yeah. Target shooting. Nope. None. Mm -hmm. That was the only that was the only time uh, that I ever um, fired a gun when the cameras weren't rolling for this project. Was that day? And you didn't see anybody like take guns out during lunch or after production hours, no. anything of the sort. No, um, and I know that that's um, that that's uh, being okay. talked about because 
I've even got uh, my wife is like showing the text. <laughs> I'll show you kind of what what I received. Uh, Takes a lot of balls to ride a strange horse. Yeah, I I'm not horse experienced. I'd be kind of worried about horses. I'm looking at their stuff. Yeah, but I did I did hear that. Uh, that someone may have taken the guns and done some target shooting or something, and that just seemed crazy to me. Like nobody really messes with crops like, right. during production, unless it's scheduled. Yeah. Unless the producers are like, we need, you know, we need training for an actor. We need to take him out and or take her out and, and teach her or him how to use, how to properly use and properly shoot. And, um, but this was a low budget thing that wasn't happening. We didn't really get the opportunity to to do that, nor did, in my opinion, did we miss it. I didn't need it. Um, but there so he's basically saying, hey, um, you know, there should not be any, uh, not be any messing with the guns other than, you know, proper stuff there. Um, I see. I think Ian McCollum should be a film armor slash research assistant consultant. I think he's actually done um, film armoring stuff. So, um, yeah, I, this is cool. I'm kind of nerding out about going to the, uh, going to his brewery. I'm trying to figure out if that brewery, like I see curbside and in-house order. Oh, I guess that's gotta be in-house. So it looks like you can eat in there. I'm, I'm going, uh, 100% I'm going, um, uh, we're going to make that happen because I'm going to be in the area. Um, I will see if, um. What is it? I'm going to see if Kurt will join because that would be cool. Some actors that have, would have benefited from that, maybe, but they knew what they were getting into. This is a, a low budget film. This, you know, it's like guerrilla shooting. We just, you, you got to get on that horse and hope it goes the way you want it. <laughs> uh, it's kind of scary when it comes to horses, but. And guns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't find that text. Okay. okay. I'm just curious, and this is a little off topic. Yeah. Um, I know the day, the day of the incident, we went out there. Yeah. Uh, were you at base camp when we arrived, or no, we because just because we didn't see you there? I was just standing back from set. Okay. I was I was still there. I know they told everybody to go to base camp, but mm -hmm. I don't know. It wasn't my it's not my MO. We're still trying to gather everybody that was close to the incident to interview. And... Yeah, I was. Uh, I had moved away from the church, but was still in proximity, okay. still watching. Uh, in fact, I even I think I even took a picture just as things were unfolding. I don't know, I don't know why I did this, but, um, but this was this was kind of where I was um, in proximity. You, know, you can see the you can see the oh, okay, yeah, you can see the units and the yeah. and So I was I moved I probably moved about hundred yards away and just. Sure. So this all this man nobody wants to see that kind of thing from me. Yeah. <laughs> and moving it back towards that. Uh, Back towards that, uh, the truck. that that box truck. Yeah. Okay. Um, Straight up, that's true. So yeah. So as as you guys were were arriving, I was just kind of like moving back, and I walked back to the shuttle and was like, "Gonna get in," and then I was like, "No, I'm just gonna be pacing at base camp, wanting to see, wanting to see how they get Joel and Elena out." Because at that point, they were still conscious and they were still like, "I didn't know. I, I never thought this would have been a fatal wound." He thought they were going to be fine. Like, okay, they got here quick. They're treating her. They're treating him on site. They're going to get them out. And but I, I was standing by waiting for updates on what was happening inside because I wanted to know what was happening with with my director and my DP, who I've been yeah, not definitely. working intimately close with for the past three and a half weeks every day. What time did um, the day start that day? Uh, every day started around sunrise and it ended was at sunset. That was pretty much. Do you know about what time you started? Uh, I could go back and look, but um, I would have gotten there. Uh, I would have gotten there probably at six fifteen, six thirty, somewhere in there, ready for seven thirty. Okay. And what time do you do you break for lunch? Six hours after call. I think it was about would have been eight o'clock call maybe. So yeah, two one thirty maybe. It's usually hmm. six hours after call, whatever call was that day, and I forget what it was. Six hours after call, call for so, lunch. So that's that's a later lunch. Um, they bring the actors in to get them processed, which is. 
But yeah, lunch was six hours after call. We were about and halfway through the interview. And then we would wrap usually at sunset. Okay. Do you know what time you came back from lunch? Not exactly. I, I do remember it being, well, I'm showing you right now. So this happened. That was at two o'clock. Now, I tell clients when they're meeting with, uh, you know, if they're having to meet with police, um, yeah, um, just don't bring your phone because this is risky. I mean, he's not here as a suspect or whatever else, but there are plenty of circumstances where I've seen officers take somebody's phone and just, um, that's it. Um, so, um, now I'm just, uh, sorry folks. My, I just got a notification there. Um, all right, let's, uh, have a look. Uh, yeah, so we broke, we broke the lunch probably around one, just after one o'clock. And it was, I believe, like a half hour lunch, and then we came back. Okay. I, don't, I, I mean, I'm kind of guesstimating. Um, How? I think you would be able to know to tell you exactly, because they, they, they log all that stuff. Production, okay. production reports have exact times on all that stuff. How quickly after lunch did the incident take place? It was the first shot, the first, uh, I keep saying shot. It's like, I got to come up with a better term for camera shot. Um, it was the first setup after lunch, the first camera setup after lunch. Um, so they turned around. I'd they say not facing, to. Uh, the, um, uh, others, the, the other end of the church, um, not the door. Opposite and the door. I'm going to be flying and to Texas. Starting so. with a tight insert of Alec pulling the gun out. And then they, and then I walk in. I have my few words. I think they were going to pull back. To see Actors work hard. Alex, pulls, I'm, I'm never going to say that they don't. The camera, and then he jumps out and starts shooting at me. So that would have been the first setup. So they were setting lights. They were getting camera. They were picking out lenses, all that kind of stuff. Selena was right there. Joel was right there. Alec was right there showing the action. This is what we do. And that's, that's a very, very normal um, procedure when you're setting up a camera shot is the actor goes through the action, what they're going to do. Then the, the DP says, okay, then I need to light over here. I need to bounce right here. I need to put the camera. I want, it, I want it to be right here. Let's put a 50 milliliter, a 50 mil lens on. Uh, the director's like, okay. And then we go into a camera rehearsal, which is not rolling just, Let's see every, all the action with the camera. If there's a move, a camera move. So the action with the camera move. Boom. Okay, great. Let's roll sound. Let's do a take. So this was the the this is kind of an interesting view we into had, they weren't even, um, we weren't even into rehearsal yet. You know, into Did the background see, of uh, filming, right? Who handed Alex the gun at lunch? No. What about putting his belt on and making the sort of thing? No. Okay. Um, again, I was just outside the set. Um, I was in there for. A little bit like watching him kind of like do some setup stuff mm -hmm. and then i was like oh, okay they're just setting up so i just stepped outside to get some you know air because they got pretty dusty gets pretty dusty in there <clears throat> during I mean, he's the only one who comes out of this looking at all queue, good uh after lunch do you, was a gun supposed to be loaded with dummies or was it no rounds in the chamber kind of thing it should have been loaded with dummies okay yeah there were no he was not um we weren't getting into the firefight at that um, for that particular setup. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine the next setup would have been. I can make a we list. We would have loaded our guns with, with blanks, and we would have gotten into. Uh, I can let this roll. I'm going to step away for just um, one second. So I'll be right back. It, it should have been a, a full of dummies because it was going to be a tight shot of the gun with those guns because they're so. They On the card. I just um, screwed that up, didn't I? I said, "Hey, I'm going to let this run," and then I muted it. And because I muted my mic, it muted everything else. Sorry about that. Uh, I <laughs> I really elaned that. All right, let's uh, let's go back. Because it was going to be a tight shot of the gun with those guns because they're so they're so old and rudimentary. You can see the brass. Elaine. So you can see the brass. You can see the your tips, mic. You can see the bullets. Um, so they would have been loaded with with dummies to. 
so it look like real. To make the appearance of that so it's loaded. To make it look like it's, it's loaded with real bullets. So what you're catching there is that the um, the whole purpose of that is that um, you know the reason why they use dummies is because from the front they look like a real cartridge, and this is really important. Uh, when you're actually dealing with a revolver, because from a, you know at the semi-auto, uh, you're not going to be able to see the you're not going to be able to see any of the cartridges, right? But if you have the um, uh, if you're uh, not doing that, then you uh, like with a revolver because it's open in the front. That's uh, that's a difficulty, um, and. Did you take care of your eyes and hands? Yes, I went and washed my... Well, I washed my hands anyway. And then I had my phone so that I could listen to the stream, so that I could just listen to the... Um, um, you know, so I could make sure that I was following along with what the interview was doing. And I was like, why am I not getting it? Oh, crap. <laughs> I had to run back. Um, Did you ever see the dummies on the set? Did you see what they looked like? Uh, I certainly saw the ones on my gun every, every morning. Okay. Because um, my gun was loaded with dummies every morning. Um, and, but I never, um, I can't remember if I ever walked over them. I mean, Oops, this one. Nothing kills the vibe like seeing crimped cases and all the firearms. Yeah, I mean, as a gun person, when you can see, like, when you see the, the dummies there, uh, or when you see blanks in a uh, shot, I'm just like, what the heck? And uh, let me see if I can find a, a picture here. Um uh, cause the, uh, what is it? There was an image that got put out and, uh, might be tough to find right here. Uh, and they had a, a picture there of, uh, I can't find it right away or readily, but the Canadian military put out an ad picture, uh, that actually had, um, this guy with, you know, ammo belts on him the problem is, is that the ammo belts were actually the uh were dummies and so like looking at that i'm just going are you kidding me uh the heading on that was you know when you know when canadians stop saying i'm sorry i'm just like yeah and start just making noises that don't do anything so and yeah, I walked over to the to the camera card. I'm sorry, uh, not camera card, the props card, to either get to receive my my uh, belt and gun or to hand it off at the end of the day or at lunch. Um, and I remember seeing I remember seeing the ammunition boxes there on the card. Um, but I can't. I wouldn't be able to tell you more than that. Well, you had mentioned the, earlier that they had clay tips. Mm -hmm. Did the ones that you saw have clay tips? I would have no reason to think otherwise. Okay. Uh, without without getting them in, in like a really intense uh, uh, inspection, um, I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, I would have. I would have looked at. I would have looked at the the the, the tray of bullets. Um, I'm sorry, the tray of, of dummy rounds, and assumed that they were all dummy rounds. And you could have very easily mixed in a half a dozen live rounds in there, and I, I wouldn't have known the difference from a, from a visual inspection. I would have taken out, either shake them or inspect the uh, what they call brass ring on the back. The primer? Not the primer. Yeah. Um, I mean, but yes, it was the primer. All dummies have punch primers. All the punch primers. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, and I, which I've done before, but I, I, I hadn't, I hadn't really done this project, nor have I felt, nor I felt the need to do it. If it's a clay tip, is it? This is why you're supposed to be checking that each time. And uh, yeah, this was whoops. This was a a movie that just made me go nuts. Um, what is it? Hitman had some great examples of bad blank usage or just empty guns. There's a scene in the one Hitman movie where the guy shoots the gun and it zooms in on the cartridge that's flying out of the gun and you could tell that it was a fired blank. And I'm going, really? Re like, I would have no problem with that if they actually... Um, I'd have no problem with that if it was a plot point. I would think that would be exceptional if somebody did that as a plot point. Where you know you have somebody shoot somebody with a rifle and there's a big splatter of blood and whatever, and it pans over and you see the blank crypt, and so that would be sort of an if you're a gun person you already can know that this person has used a blood pack 
you know, this is a faked up thing. They haven't actually shot that person. I would think that that would be a fantastic thing to include in a movie. But they don't. Um, you know, and I see that's dumb. They could have just fixed it in post. They didn't think they had to. They didn't realize that that was a big issue. Um, there's another, there was a British crime drama. And so one of the things was that they had as a big pivotal moment is this guy is trying to actually kill himself. And he realizes uh, when he fails to, when he fails to sort of self delete, sorry, YouTube, um, that, that there's been a plot against him. And so the effort on that one, and the way that happens is that he finds out that somebody has loaded his gun with blanks and that that's what tells him that, uh, in fact, there's a further conspiracy. But he f survives this attempt because he puts the gun to his head and fires and, sur and survives. And I'm going, a blank could kill you at that distance, like a blank. So... Uh, that just ticked me off. It it just took me out of the, the show entirely. What color is it? It's made yeah. exactly like a live round. Looks like lead. They don't make um, live rounds. Said that your, the guns were loaded every morning. Did you ever see who loaded them? Um, I only ever witnessed Hannah loading. Okay. Did, she, did you see her load them that morning? I should remember. I wouldn't be able to tell you what mornings I did and what mornings I didn't. I just know that if I was happening, happening to walk by the prop start and seeing her at work, I wouldn't have been like, I wouldn't have really taken notice. It's just everybody's work. Everybody's doing their job. You know, people are setting up lights. People are moving boxes. This are, makes you know, perfect sense setting to Setting up me. their cameras. She's right. loading up her weapons. Like that was just, that was her job. So it wouldn't have stood out to me. Okay. How many days uh, prior to incident day did you guys do live fire? Was I live in I'm going to address this. Somebody saying her hair proves she has a bad attitude. No, it doesn't. It proves she's a cop. Um, she's got long hair. You know what cops with long hair do when they're on the job? They tuck it up. She's got that in a tight bun there because cops are trained and learn to, uh, to keep that so that nobody can grab it. I mean, sure. She's just doing an interview there, but, um, yeah, you that's that's why her hair is like that cuz that's such a such an ignorant sort of comment there. Uh blanks are considered deadly inside 15 feet for handguns, 25 feet for shotguns and 30 to 35 feet for rifles based on caliber. Yep. Um So, yeah, my bestie is a cop, her hair is always up when she's on duty. Yep. That that's exactly it. Why is this guy talking to the police? Because he's a witness, but also it's not sort of a great move there. Um, cops don't want to handle. Absolutely. Yep. Um. Move, move, fire. Um. Uh. Looks like it's somebody else grabbed that one. Um, the day before we, we did live fire, um, I, got, I got shot. Uh, Travis Fimmel, uh, his character shoots me in the, in the shoulder. And so we did, uh, he, he fired off a half, a half load at me. He's um, thinking about this, right? But I felt safe. I was more than 20 feet away, which is usual industry protocol. Um, 20 feet away from a blank. It was going to be a large concussion. concussion. Um, and, uh, and I didn't have to do a, a squib. I just ended up spinning the ground. Um, but then in addition to that, uh, Alec also fired that day. This is the day before. So when he says that he didn't have to do a squib, uh, a squib would be like a, a blood pack or something that bursts on him. Uh, he says he didn't have to, you know, didn't have to do that. Yeah, and there are some spoilers, but I mean, this is out there. Um, yeah, he didn't have to do a squib. He just spins so it looks like, oh, I've been hit. Now, if you watch actual video of shooting, people don't tend to do those spins that they do in, in you know, in videos and whatever. They just get hit. And, yeah, people getting actually shot tends to be a little different than uh, than what it looks like in, uh, in movies. Um, also, part of that day. But, again, those kinds of, of, of 
uh, instances, they would be they'd be taking out the dummy rounds and putting in print tip blanks. So print. very clearly yeah. not a uh, doesn't look like a real bullet. The sole the sole purpose of having a muzzle flash. Um, That's exactly it. That's why they when that happens when they take out the dummies and they put in the crimp tips. And it's you got a hot gun, you know, six rounds. Everybody's safety. Everybody get back. You don't have to be on set. Get out. Uh, camera if they if they are close. Um, you know, once I I did a shot very close to camera, and they put up uh, they put a protective uh, so, yeah uh, Lexan. Um, hot gun. This could kill somebody, right? Because um, yeah. So uh, you basically have it where it's. Uh, you got to make sure there's minimal people. Everybody's got to put on, you know, eyes and ears. So eyes and ears are, you know, your eye protection, your ear protection, you know. So if you're ever on a range, you'll hear, you know, range is going hot, eyes and ears. Um, same thing as on film sets, right? Uh, squibs are blood-filled packs with explosives to give the experience of bullet impact because of the explosive. That's under Armory 2, or it should be. Making them is an interesting Walmart trip. Um I mean, where I am, that would be done by special effects. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of the same thing. I assume they check the barrel for obstructions before loading blanks. You bet they do. Um, yep. The hot plate of the restaurant world is the hot gun of the film world. Kind of. Yep. Got to say, this guy is a perfect witness to interview. A cop's dream. Perfectly credible. Answers every question. No equivocation. Says he doesn't know when he doesn't know. This guy is actually going to be a really good witness. Right. Um, I I think he's going to be an excellent witness at, at a trial because he's just, you know, he's not. Um, if you compare him to like the sisters uh, for, or the, you know, the daughters from uh, the Paltrow trial, you know, he's not sort of taking that defensive stance. He's not evading. He's not equivocating. He's not um, giving answers that are just bizarre, um, you know. He's just directly answering the questions. This guy's a good witness, right? My take is that he's answering honestly and he's not trying to hide anything or cover anything up or help anyone. He's just giving his version, right? Um, which is fantastic. So, and I will go through a little bit of super chats here. What other jobs can Armour have besides films? Um, I don't know what else they'd do other than films. Um Maybe, I mean, sometimes armors do contracting work for other armors. So on the movie, The Crow, Brandon Lee died on the set of his movie with a live round killing him. It wasn't a live round. It was a blank firing a uh, projectile from a dummy that had wiggled out. It was a real tragedy. Uh, do you remember this? I do. Ian, can you fake a British accent? Um, yes, but the Brits will hate me because it's not great. I think you need a British accent for Lord of the Rings. I can't imagine that I could get us i might be able to finagle somehow getting a uh like if i was able to be in the area to get like an extra part i cannot see that i would ever get a um you know a, i can't see a speaking role so not a need to worry i had a, another i shot off shotgun at one point and our a camera operator and he was very close and i was like we need to get more nice i need, I need more stuff for him i didn't feel comfortable i was like i need more stuff for him it's very common um I've, I've, I've done that many times, like where the camera camera guys are like, oh, I can get in here. And I'm like, no, I'm not shooting at you that close. And that's just because a, a lot of it's just, uh, the, really the biggest threat from a movie gun is uh, is uh, gunpowder dust. Getting sprayed <laughs> in your eyes and burning your eyes. I don't think that would it's be really a big, the, you know, feeling threat. The wadding yeah. thing, that's a thing of the past. We don't use that stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so really the, the safety measure is to protect people's eyes. And also, um, if you're too close, and I'm using a, a shotgun, I use a full load. I feel like it hit the chest just from the concussion of the of the blast. Yeah. If you're if you're too close, which you know might injure you in some way, shape, or form. I don't know, but still, I do feel like this is going to be difficult, right? Uh, testifying against a fellow actor might suck, and um, yeah. Um, So, uh, give me one second. All right. Uh, 
see all this stage reenactment, pyrotechnics in some cases, FFL sellers, gunsmiths. In my case, I'm also a makeup and FX artist, and I'm building a private zoo on contract. So whatever skills we can market. That is cool. Um, I, I would love at some point to just... Um, it would be awesome to work with an armor on a film set, but it would just be... Um, you know, just as sort of a, a gopher and whatever else. But um, yeah, hot gas out of a barrel can kill you. Stay away. Yeah, especially if it's pressed up against. Uh, yeah. Um. All right. Well, I just I feel comfortable when I know if there's protective stuff in front and, you know, nobody's in harm's way. Um, and like I said, we had a we had a shootout maybe a week prior to this where I, put all, I, I, I think I uh, let off two half loads on the shotgun, dumped the dumped the long gun, and then drew a pistol and fired off all six rounds. Okay. Um, but again, all blanks. And then when the sh when it was prior to that, it was loaded with dummies. It was always loaded with dummies, just so it looked like it had. Right. Um. Baldwin is supposed to check it with the armor as it's being handed to him. That's that's the way that goes. Uh, so Baldwin is part of the safety uh, protocol there. Uh, and I see we've got uh, Reeb, who isn't that Reeb, I don't think. Uh, this is Jensen Ackles, who is one of the actors from uh, from uh, the Rust movie, but also more famously known for uh, Supernatural. What about the accidental discharges that happened? Didn't hear anything about that. Had no idea what people were talking about. I, I don't know if that happened, then it's strange I didn't hear about it because, like I said, I was on set most of the time. So, A, didn't happen while I was there. I didn't witness anything like that. And B, I never even heard about it. So, I don't know. This is interesting because, I mean, that seems to me like there's people telling everybody to just quiet, quiet down. And, um, yeah. Um, if an actor has a prohibition regarding firearms, can he legally use a prop gun? If the gun is a legal firearm, uh, then in Canada, you would not be permitted to legally use the prop gun, even on a film set. Oh, okay. um, what about that squib that went off? Um, yeah, I, I do remember that. And yes, again, they, like, that kind of stuff happens. Properly, they should be going over it with the armor. Like the armor should be showing them. I have seen like a dozen pictures from armorers of them demonstrating to the talent that the gun was safe and that was being properly loaded just before the talent goes on, uh, you know, goes on. So, yeah. Like my gun jammed on the, the firefight. Like guns jam. All the time. Um, yeah, they do. You know, it's that kind of stuff is 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 normal on a on a movie set or on a on a TV set that's dealing with firearms. Uh, you know, you, you instantly yell "cut" as an actor. I would just yell. I just like I was like "cut, cut, cut, got a jam," and I would literally just aim, keep it aim towards the ground, and the armor would come over and take it from me and fix it. Good. Reload it. Okay, we're good. All right, roll sound. Very very commonplace for that stuff to happen. That's not a. I, I wouldn't chalk that up as a safety issue. Okay. That's just yeah. guns doing what they do. Okay. And I agree with this, right? You get, I mean, I've run three gun competitions and I've had gun problems where, you know, your gun, I had one where literally my handgun jammed solid and I ended up like dumping it in the dump sled, which is there for that purpose. And then continuing on with something else. Right. But if you're filming something, you might be like, stop everything. we got to. So, yeah, that's entirely reasonable. What about, um, did you ever, you know, I know you guys have like safety bulletins and stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a safety meeting every morning. And there was one every before morning. this production? Every morning. Who hosted that? Dave. Okay. That's, that's the first AD's job, is to host a safety meeting every morning. Oh. Um, whoops. Can Ian explain why guns jam? Absolutely. Um, guns jam for all sorts of reasons. Um, I mean, one thing is you might have a double feed where you've got two cartridges that are trying to feed at the same time. Um, you can have, um, what is it? You can have situations where you get, um, uh, 
you know, a failure to feed, you know, it's not quite a jam, but it's going to feel like you pulled the trigger and nothing happens. Um, you can have all sorts of, um, all sorts of problems. I see, will I be streaming Dave Hall's uh, plea hearing on Friday? It's scheduled for 10 a.m. Mex New Mexico time and will be streamed. I feel like I'm going to have to. Um, I feel like that is something I'm going to have to do. Um, so um, that'll make it difficult. I'll probably have to do my recap for the uh, uh, Paltrow trial on Saturday then. But um, yeah, it's um, there's all sorts of reasons. So. I'm not. I'm not usually. Actors are, are not usually there, uh, but it's for. It's not for us. It's for the crew. I'm guessing that's when they hand out. You know, ear protection, eye protection. If uh, you guys are gonna shoot half loads or quarter loads. Like, yeah, we're gonna have live animals on set today. We're gonna have. We're gonna have live gunfire. Uh, you know, we're gonna have. We've got strong winds coming this afternoon. We want everybody to safety their equipment. That's the safety meeting. It's for the crew to let them know what we're dealing with today. If there's any safety concerns, where you go, who you need to talk to. Uh, your and I uh, safety equipment will be available. This is where it's available. Like all that. And that happens every morning. And you were there nice. for... I was, I was not there. Was I there for that day? I can't remember if I was there uh, for the safety meeting that day, but I know I, I walked in on, on a safety meeting multiple times because they would call us to set and I'd arrive on set while they were doing uh, the safety meeting. Do they post it like anywhere else on, you know, your call sheets or do they send you mm -hmm. guys like a protocol of like, hey, today we're dealing with five animals, therefore these are your protocols? Call sheets. That's on the call sheets. And, and you saw it on these call sheets? I, I mean, again, like it doesn't really pertain to me, so I kind of skip over it, but I do know that it's, it, it, it is, uh, so those be it is there and usually there and it probably was that day. Those are easy to get. You can get those call sheets. Call sheets. I'll have those on file so you can see whether or not the safety guidelines were there that day or whether they even needed to be. I said, that's probably an OSHA thing. He's like, hey, here's how you go and get the, um, here's Any how you get this information. Ever complain, uh, that we're handling a revolver ever complain about a faulty hammer no. on the gun? No. Not to me. Not for us. Yep. You can start seeing Do the you know, union so rules not being applied and, in the practice. Uh, yep. uses? Mm -hmm. Where is it normally? Close by set. Okay. Um, it's, the, it's essentially their work cart. Everybody has kind of their workstations. Camera, there's a camera cart. There's, uh, you know, a, a grips cart. There's an electrics cart. The props cart. Everybody has their kind of rolling workstations that wherever the set is that rolls with them and goes there, and that's where they. You got your gear. It's got to be movable. From that cart. Right. Okay. Did you happen to see um, this? You know that particular day, um, where that cart was, or where is it supposed to go during lunch? Do you know? Uh, yeah, I'm not super happy about would, this part. Um, stay put. Straight but up. They would, and I don't know this. I don't know if this happened. I can't say yes or no, but I, I just know, um, generally speaking, they would safety. Yeah, he's uh, going to be guns particularly pleasant. and rounds. They're they're going to call him uh, during lunch. They would go lock them up. They're going to lock up like in the truck. Okay. Um, did you see anybody do it that day? I did not. Nor did I see them do it any day. But that's just because I wasn't looking. Okay. That's not to say that it didn't happen every day. I would imagine it would have happened every day. Okay. Um, that's that's pretty standard protocol. Is there? You know, uh, obviously we're dealing with this whole issue with cam crew. Um, yeah. And then I said that they had walked off. How many people did you see from that camera crew that morning? None, because uh, I wasn't on set when the situation happened. Okay. Um, we were back at base camp. We were told to come to set and then got turned around and went back. So my only account of what happened was just from later going up to Bruce's going, what's fuck? Okay. But you didn't observe any of them nope. there? Nope. Okay. I observed them on previous days. Um, you know, one in particular just bitch. She was just, you know, he was just kind of a whiny bitch, <laughs> to put it to put it simple. Uh, you know, I, I recall rolling my eyes at, you know, several of his little outbursts of, of a variety of things. Okay. Um, you know, lunch wasn't big enough. That kind of shit. Like, really, go to craft service. There's food galore all day long. Yeah. You're well fed. Calm down. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, we get well fed when we go. I got to go back to this. happened okay. um we were back at base camp we were told to come to set and then got turned around and went back so my only account of what happened was just from later going up the bridge was going what the fuck but you didn't observe any of them nope. there nope. okay i observed them on previous days um you know one in particular just bitch 
just, just you know, it was just kind of a whiny bitch. <laughs> okay. To put it to put it simple. Uh, okay, it's not clear. You know, I, I about recall rolling my eyes at you know several of his little outbursts of a variety of things. Like, is this Alec um, he's talking about or somebody you know, else? Lunch wasn't big enough. That kind of shit. Like, really, go to craft service. There's food galore all day long. Yeah. You're well fed. Calm down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, we get well fed when we go work on Yeah, this. exactly. So. That's what I'm saying. Like, anybody who's complaining about the, the you know, the food on a film set is, is a whiny bitch. Okay. I mean, is there um, anything that would lead you to believe that one of these camera people would have brought? I think uh, in my, I mean, I know. We're I think he's just talking opinions, about somebody but like. In a, my opinion, I just feel that I just find it very hard to believe that they would bring it on set. Uh, camera crew member, I see. Yeah. Okay. Most camera guys are, they're nerds. I mean, I love camera guys. I'm a nerd too. Like I, I'm, I'm a geek about that stuff. But you know, these are guys that go out and get live rounds and shoot from a camera. Yeah. 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 Ye
my finger off the trigger, right? It's um, it's just what you do when you're used to firearms because it's a very important safety rule. So um, but no, as far as as far as trigger safety goes, not really. How do you think this lead ammo does set? That's what I want to do. I'm sure. I'm sure you've heard uh, all the rumors that I have, and probably more. I think of, that's a concealed uh, uh, carry. Somebody license. maliciously planning it, which I just, I, I'd, I'd be shocked if that's if that's what it was. Somebody trying to ruin an Alec Baldwin film because because he's polarizing in his political beliefs in real life. It seems like a pretty extreme, a pretty extreme thing to do. Um, and then I've also heard that that. Uh, you know, Hannah took the guns and went clinking with um, some of her friends or some crew, or and then got intoxicated and um, didn't remember putting everything back and could have mistakenly loaded real rounds of her prop dummy rounds and just not and forgot about it the next day and came back and said, oh, here's my dummies. Did you ever witness? Now, it's worth noting that he's talking about rumors here. Um, and it doesn't seem that there's any backing up to the notion of them using the guns like for target practice on set. That doesn't seem to be um, seem to be a thing there. However, um, you know, the intoxicated does seem to be something that they were alleging here. And um, this is a good question. What about after you fired the first round? Do you then take your finger off the trigger before the second? If you're not planning on shooting right away again, then yes, you take your finger off the trigger if you're not looking to do that. I have actually seen this done. Um, I've actually seen this done for dramatic effect by some people who knew sort of what they were doing, where they've got the act, like they've got the, uh, the character there who's got the gun pointed, and then you see them move their finger to the trigger, and it's like, oh, now he's serious. That I was like, cool. Um, that, that I was like, awesome. Just for a drink? Oh. What about anybody else? Uh, that's not true. Um, there was one evening where uh, a large a large part of the cast and crew uh, ended up at the same bar in Santa Fe. Um, and I did see her there. But that was on set? Yeah, that was on a weekend. Okay. Yeah. And that was the only, time, that that was the only time I ever saw her also. Okay. And most of those people. And she hadn't mentioned anything about going out and nope. I think they're kind of fun to shoot, of... but I'm I'm Who was ultimately in charge of safety. What is that? Mm -hmm. Um yep. from an overall just... standpoint, uh the first AD. So David. He would be he would be the generalized like safety guy. But then there are specialty people that are the horse wranglers say this he's responsible for the safety of the horses i mean if a horse takes off dave's not the one who goes and gets it yeah that's what we have horse wranglers for yeah. and we had that happen multiple times where a horse bucked loose and took off running and they had to go chase him down um what's that it sounds like some untrained horses yeah they weren't they weren't overly trained <laughs> 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 they weren't over i'm gonna say it's not common that you're getting laughing happening in um in police interviews, but it does happen sometimes. And um, I'm just thinking back to a police interview where this guy thought the police were on his side and um, the police very much weren't. The police were very much getting him to admit things that were very damaging to him. And the police were laughing with him about some things that were pretty horrific, like uh, let's just say harm to children. So, um, you know, just because the police are laughing doesn't necessarily mean they're on their so on your side. But here, I think it's just because Ackles is genuinely a personable human being. So, you know, it doesn't feel like it's tactic here. It feels like it's just that everybody's kind of having a... This is a very casual conversation for one of these rooms. Who provided the horses? Uh, I forget. I don't know the name of the outfit. I just I just remember the is name of the ring. The, the, the guy from Lumbu, you know? Right down the street from the ranch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I used to wrangle for him, and yeah, he had some for the. He always put me on. Oh really? Trouble horses. Oh like, yeah. She used to wrangle for the guy yeah, who did he, the they horses. They put me on a trouble horse because I, again, I, I'm not afraid. Like I have confidence around horses. Yeah. I'm not an amazing rider, but I, I was comfortable. I'm comfortable around horses. Um, That's again, just going cool. back to the, the safety aspect of it, you know, uh, um, Raleigh uh, was the, the the lead 
Wrangler if he was in charge of of horses. Uh, Alan uh, was in charge of stunts, so he was in charge of any kind of uh, stunts that that were um, that were happening with the actors or the stunt people. Um, I didn't do a whole like I mean, for instance, like when I got shot, I did a spin and hit the ground. It's how his responsibility to come up to me and go, "Do you need pads? Do you feel comfortable?" You know, blah, I'm blah, glad blah. to hear that, Not Dave. You know, he's he's kind of the he's kind of the umbrella safety, but then there are specific people that are designated to safety specific aspects of the filmmaking. Um, so again, Alan would have been for stunts, Rolly would have been for horses, Hannah would have been for ammunition. Did you ever hear any complaints? I'm going to try stepping this up to one point. No, I was five. surprised to hear that. Okay. Is there anything else that you can think of that you know would stick out, or you know that might help us out? It, I mean, it just it be speculative. I'm, I'm sure you guys are getting all that. Um, you know, I didn't. Uh, again, I I personally felt safe, but I will say that it was largely due because of my personal safety measures. Um, I feel like this is entirely it was reasonable. A it was a loose, as far as done safety goes, from my experience. So safety um, is a little loose. A little but also loose. Then, Part of big budget things that have highly qualified and experienced people doing these jobs. Did you ever see anybody like overly pressuring him to do anything? Now, would he see like, that where she would have felt intimidated? Or no, she seemed to have. She was, you know, she, she had a kind of a cocky confidence air to her. Um, you know, she spread it around. She was, she was the armor. Probably one of the youngest ones there are. So she 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 wore that a little bit outwardly. So she never seemed uncomfortable with that's not a great look. No. Was being asked of her. No. You want what some you modesty no, she seemed very when you're and, handling and firearms. Everything had no there was no stuttering or, or shiftiness or uh hesitancy on her part. She that's why I was like I, I, you know, I felt like she had she had the confidence and she was saying all the right words and doing all the right things and if uh if she, if she didn't know what she was doing, she was certainly taking it well. Um, Going back to Hannah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So with her, I'm sure you've seen the statement that she's released. Yeah. Um, Saying that she was not given the time or... or and that she was pressing for training right. and <clears throat> stuff like that. Any knowledge for that? Which, I mean... <sighs> in my opinion, I think it's, it's, uh, this was a low-budget move. Same thing, the same reason I think that the, the camera crew was walking off the with so low budget, there's not budget for, for putting everybody up for four seasons. I'm sure they'd like to do that, but they can't do that. They don't have money. My answers gave a certain amount of money. That's how much we had to get it done. Everybody who came on the show, everybody who came on this, on this movie knew that it was going to be tight. Um, I would have loved to have had three weeks of horse training, you know, yeah. but I didn't. I had, a half, I had a half a day, I had an afternoon to, to pick a horse out and ride him around and get comfortable. And then the next day I was on camera on the horse. That's oh, that's man. For I mean, me, I mean, I've never ridden like a horse, so that would be, uh, that'd be rough. I mean, I, I wouldn't have been privy to that. If she was having private conversations with the producers going like, I really need, you know, I need Jensen for half a day. I need Alec for a day. I yes, need... the armor has been charged. And, and again, I would never have expected that phone call on a project like this. I knew they were hiring me for, you know, for what I could do. They asked me, you know, have, have you written more support? I was like, yeah, okay. We, we know we've seen from your work that you clearly handled guns before, so we know you're good there. So I feel like there was, you know, a part of... Yeah, we've seen Supernatural. You've handled like six with, guns every different and not episode. needing additional training, not needing to come out three weeks early and rehearse with horses and with weapons and even rehearsing with the dialogue. Mm -hmm. We didn't get rehearsal. That's, you know, that's something that big budget movies get. You know, you come in, you rehearse for, with the director and the actors for weeks and then, and then you go to camera. Yeah, yeah. I don't watch hockey, like but I guess oil, Oilers, oil, oil I live in Edmonton. Like, here's your yeah. Uh, yeah. Never like, been here's to a Corbin These are the words you're saying. Here's your gun. This is what you're shooting. And here's your horse. Good luck, cowboy. Hope you can envision it in your head. Yeah. And I, I hope you envision <laughs> your head. And I hope you can pull it off. You know, yeah. I mean, I was, there was, I think the second day I was on that horse, we were, they were like, okay, run to that ridge and then just come, come screaming down at us. Okay. And so I was, you know, riding, 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 trying to keep my hat from flying off, you know, eyes down, trying to get that. And we were going, we we're going, and, and my poor horse hit one of those uh, groundhog holes and just uh, like went down, and the whole horse went like pitched forward. And I was like, here I go. Yeah. And then I just yanked up at the last second, and he lifted up right at the last second. And, and I was just, I, I know I held it together because I, I looked at the playback and I was, I was like, right away. <laughs> but inside I was screaming. Like a little kid. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah. Um, but again, that's a moment where you could die. Like you're going full out and your horse hits, you know, hits a hole. Um, you could die. 
Like that is. And the horse could die, right? Because the horse breaks a leg. That's probably the end of the horse, right? So, um, yeah. Um, what are my thoughts on the prop master, Sarah, not being charged? She was bringing the ammo on set and shot herself in the foot. Um, I think it's just lacking evidence. Um, that's my thought on that. So uh, we'll have to... Uh, I'll, I'm going to have to watch you know, any of her. Uh, if she did an interview, I'll have to watch that. So... We all would have loved rehearsal on a variety of levels. Not sure how to the bond with everyone too. Sure, but that's not. We knew that that's not what we were going to get with this project. Everybody knew that. You had said, all right. So, and I know you talked about this was a cutting corners project. You know, in car terminology, everything was The day of the incident, mm -hmm. after lunch, when you guys know about your gear and everything was all right, mm -hmm. did anybody call out? No, cold gun, hot gun, anything of the sort like that. Um, I know that that's been reported that Dave uh, yelled cold gun. Um, I was just standing off set, so I didn't hear that. But he wouldn't have needed to scream up to everybody outside the set. He would have just, if, if in fact he hit the gun, which I think he is admitted to, which, if my regulation serves me, I, th I thought I remember Hannah walking into set, um, with the gun, and in my mind, and I don't know if I'm just filling in blanks here because I didn't see it, or if I did see it, like one of those things, like did I see that, or am I just filling in a blank? The, the set was so, like, you know, Alec was here, Cameron was here, Elena, Joel, Dave was here, and so Hannah came in from the back. It would have been made perfect sense for her to be like. Uh, here's how it's done, and him go, okay, great, thanks. Here you go, hold on. Or looked at it, seen her, did, did a check. I don't know if it, I don't know if that happened or not. But it's just that way because Hannah couldn't get into him. Okay. He's getting but up he and he's doing demonstrations. I, I, I feel like I saw that, but I, I, I can't, I, I can't remember if that's exactly how it happened or not. Okay. But right. I know that Hannah was right there, and if she was right there, then there would be no reason for Dave to have walked over to the cart. I know where the cart was. The cart was, you know, if this is if this is the church. Here's the, the entrance. There were tents right here where cast chairs were. The cart was on the back side of that. Okay. And then with the black bottle tents? Yes. Yeah. So it was on the back side of it? Yeah. That's where Bob's cart was. Okay. So it was, you know, a good, a, a good, yeah, like 30, 50 yards away from the entrance of the set. Okay. How far distance wise between Alec and the camera and then Colleen and Joel? Carol was right in there because it was a close up. It was, it was like literally shooting his chest because he was throwing out the gun like this, right? Okay. So the camera. <laughs> hey, let me give you a few. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it was, it was, uh, Alex, or Alec here, uh, camera there, uh, Elena there, Joel there, Reed sitting on the camera, and then there was, you know, was a, a Dave would have been here, if I remember correctly, and then there was, like, Scripty was here, Wardrobe was over here, there was a, few, a couple of others, I think, uh, Serge was right there, so. So let's talk about what he's doing, he's drawing a picture. Anytime you draw a picture like that, that's going to be saved and used as evidence because sometimes you get people who start doing that. Sometimes the officers will leave pen and paper because people might doodle and then they can, you know, they can end up with doodling issues there. Um, so, yeah, um, that's kind of a, you know, an ask, what's the difference between this and a deposition? Uh, this is not under oath, so it's not sworn. They can't just tender this as evidence. There's no cross-examination there. There's no um, anything. So this is just a police interview. It's not a deposition. But yeah, um, if the police are handing you paper and saying, can you draw something? You're usually making a mistake. But again, he's just here as a witness and he doesn't ever end up being um, charged. Just if you're ever in a police interview and they hand you paper and a pen, um, Talk to your lawyer because your lawyer's probably not going to want you touching those things. When, when Alex fired it, it, you know, it went like that. Huh? Um, and then, you know, here's the, here's the back of the church. And then this is the, the back of the church. Um, she, the camera was probably four feet. So it's really close. Oh, she was right there. It was this close. Okay. It was this close. That's why 45 rounds. Right there. She's not a big girl. It's not surprising. Any animosity between Alec and Lena? Oh, God, no. No, I really love this. Okay. Um, and he's, he was, I just started working with him. Like I said, we were shooting kind of my side. You know, I don't know if you know the story, but it was he's like a, an, an old outlaw who's surfaced, who's in bed with his surface, and is on the run. And I'm the US, but US Marshal is tasked to track him down. So we were shooting a lot of my side of the story, which didn't involve him because he was on the run and I was tracking him down, right? Mm -hmm. So we'd just gotten to filming the, the sequences where I've caught up to him. And this is, that's the point in which we, we, I catch up to him. But the day prior was, 
we shot so we, we shoot out sequences just normal film and television we shot the scenes that, that uh are after this one of he, we get into a gunfight in the church she sneaks out the back and then takes off down into an arroyo and then i, I get chase we shot that stuff the day before Shooting stuff out of sequence is super common because you're going to determine your filming sequence based on convenience, right? You're going to, um, you're going to fill, figure out your filming sequence based on like, Hey, um, let's do all of our scenes that happen in the church on one day. Right. Um, that's going to be super common. So, um, yeah. That's uh, I, some people were commenting on that and saying that it was weird, but uh, yeah, we'll just catch up on some super chats here. George, the cat met Jensen once once nicest effing guy and was so nice to my dog. He's really coming off like a great personable guy here. Right. So um, yeah, uh, I worked on set with horses. They should never have horses on bad footing with gopher holes. That is a huge safety risk. This set was a disaster. This set was basically somebody is going to die. We're just trying to figure out how. Um, we're going to leave it up to, you know, physics to figure out who dies how, but somebody's going to die. Um, yeah. We're shooting this the day of. Okay. Um, but again, you're asking about something. So, yeah, I was, if, if, if I remember correctly, I think she was probably about four feet away from when I went. And then Joel was behind her. How many shots did you get? And I was told that there were, there was only the one live round in the gun, the other five were dummies. And, you know, we have to send those to the lab just to ensure. Because I remember Dave yelling for the gun, like, where's, where's the gun, where's the gun, I want to see it. Uh, so he then inspected it, and, and, but I don't remember, I don't remember what he did with it after that, like I said. Um, and compare and contrast this with Baldwin's interview, where Baldwin comes off, you know, as uh, sometimes he says that he... Um, you know, that he doesn't know anything about guns. Sometimes he's then bragging about how much he knows and so forth. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, were there any live rounds of my gun? Or is that to be determined? Um, you had the U.S. Marshall one? Uh -huh. You have so many of them that oh, really? professional processing. Okay. I just, that would be interesting to know because I I clicked my rounds that morning when I had a gun. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember clicking it when I got back from March. So if there were live rounds of my gun. And you just had one gun on you, right? You went to the double. So, yeah. You hear that? He's asking, were there any live rounds in my gun? Um, yeah, that um, that's just concerning. So, so if there was one, if there was, if there was lives in mine, that would be very suspicious. Because there would have been no reason for... Someone to have changed those dummies out over lunch. They don't empty them for lunch? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I was going to ask a question about going back to Hannah. Uh, going back to Hannah, do you recall her uh, or witness her ever handling the weapons and safely, like in bundles or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, they would they would have, those poor girls would have gun belts just draped on them. You know, they'd have to be like, okay, here's, you know, this actor's, and here's this actor's, and here's this actor's. So, uh, you know, Sarah <laughs> would have all the gun belts, Hannah would also have the gun belts. They were, they were, they were helping each other out. Um, but again, at that point, they're, they're essentially props until they get loaded with ammunition and then it becomes an armor's uh, responsibility. Is it uncommon for them to be carrying multiple? Or like in your experience with other films, is it uncommon for them to be carrying? Multiple guns or multiple balance, anything that's saying like you have to carry one gun. Only one at a time. In fact, I, I don't, in my experience, I've seen that from multiple armorers and rough people. They'll, they'll have like a, they'll even have like a, a bag or a, a you know, a, some sort of a, a carrying multi, and they'll, they'll dump multiple weapons into it. Um, but because these were in holsters, they would just leave them in the holsters and then put the ventilators, the holsters kind of over their shoulders. And then yep, live rounds were found in Baldwin's bed. But yeah, it was, it was very common for them to like walk out on set and, and, um, distribute the, the gun belts and the, and the pistols to the actors. Do you know how many were distributed after lunch? Oh, and I missed that we were past the two hour mark, which means that we are at this point. <laughs> which means we can get a little bit spicier than we might have been before. Um, uh, if you're in a situation like this, no guilt but a witness, do you suggest a lawyer? I do, uh, because I 
reported that I was the victim of a crime and I ended up being investigated for whether I had committed a fault. Um, so, or whether I'd committed a crime. So there's always risk, right? There's always risk. It would have been, it would have been Alec, me, and Swin. Swin? Swin. Swin played, uh, my, my deputy. He played, uh, his character was Drum, short for Drummond. Um, Did you see anyone outfit him? Not there at all. I mean, we might be given the gun, we might be given our, our belts and guns at the same time. I suspect they might call him to talk about the fly or for that particular setup because he didn't have any dialogue, so he was a little further away than I was. He was just. I suspect they might call him for like the safety standards on the set. Uh, that they might also talk to him about was this different from other sets, that kind of thing. So. Kind of stand, I'm standing by waiting for the next setup to happen, but I was a little closer just because I was walking in and getting off camera. Okay. But he did have a weapon launch. I think so. I'm not sure. They could have, because he wasn't in that first shot, they may not have given it back to him. They may have waited until he was going to be needed. Um, did he only have one weapon on him? Just like me, yeah. Okay. Same style gun, too. The other martial one? Correct. So maximum three guns out after lunch. Yeah, because yeah, was that was those were the only we were the only actors and stuff at that point. Okay. Yeah, because I don't think I don't think Brady. I, don't, uh, I mean, he didn't have a gun, but Brady wasn't even there. I don't think. Anybody would have like a major safety issue. And I'm just assuming like pretty much anyone could call out like that they feel something's being unsafe. Yeah. Yeah. Something's unsafe. Anybody. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. anybody. Usually it is department heads that will. If it's something that needs to be addressed, then it is the responsibility of that crew member to either go directly to the first AD or for that crew member to tell the department head. The department head goes to the first AD and then it is up to the first AD to then tell the producers and it goes on up the chain. Okay. Um, so, was there any revamping during this entire time of safety protocols or gun protocols or anything like that? No. Zora's got opinions. No. Uh, I think it's going to be on camera, but if you, even if it's audio only, I'll Do cover it. For us? So many. You can ask. I can't guarantee we can give you exact answers, but I mean. Um, no, I, and I, I, I keep in mind when you ask a question of the officers, that question is also evidence. Um, like that is also something that um, that can be used against you. And um, what questions you ask or what questions you don't ask can be potentially a real problem for you later on. So again, you know, he's not been charged with anything, but I've seen lots of people where, you know, they, and they, I mean, they can throw things in your face. Any questions you have? Uh, no questions. Okay. Um, you didn't ask if your wife survived. It's like, well, uh, uh, no, I already knew that because, you know, like you just, they'll throw all these things in your face. Um, Questions that you guys can't answer. Is, I mean, my biggest question is how, like, where, where the bolts, where the, where the rounds come from. You know, if it was. I think I have a good intuition, um, or at least just some statements given and speaking with others. Um, I have a pretty good idea. It's just another confirming that they are the same style round. But it's the same style round? That, yeah, so we have to send it to the lab and get them pulled apart. Lab. Yeah. So we're lucky that we were set High profile case. What are you guys doing? Let's do no this. questions. That's suspicious. Yeah, no. Uh, um, our, our lab here is like, here. Yeah. Armor is in more trouble. Um, Armor is in more trouble, both because Baldwin now has a viable argument to have everything thrown out. Um, but yeah, the uh, they're going to have an easier case against her than they will against him. So yeah. So, yeah. That's why we use that data. Oh, okay. So we're going to wait a year and a half for this? We're going to get that. We're going to get a square in that. Yeah. So it'll probably be at least a couple months, but not a year and a half to two years. Okay. Time. That would be torture. Yeah. I don't really want to do that to everybody. Well, it's also, you know, it's been it's been really difficult for, for not just me, but a lot of the a lot of the other people that are part of this cast included to to watch the, the media spin and see the, the shit that they're reporting on, which is, as we all know, you know, they're, they're in the, media. yeah, they're not in, it's, it's not about news anymore. It's about sensationalism. Yeah. Um, and so any kind of, any kind of uncorroborated claim is now getting recorded and people report bullshit. Yeah. And it's really frustrating for someone like me who can say that's bullshit, but can't, but 
can't really, shouldn't. yeah. They make no. it sound good, you know, to where people actually believe well, it. Well, because like anything I say, then it's all of a sudden spun. It's like, oh, he's, you know, he's being uh, um, complacent or he's he's being sensitive to a certain person or, you know, whatever. And then, and then now I'm the face of, of that news cycle and it's like, I don't want that. And so it's like, this is fair, right? He knows he's going to be in the news. And ultimately, uh, my take isn't that he's spinning this to help anybody or anything like that. He's just sitting here just being honest, right? Um, I actually think that this is saying a lot that is positive for Ackles. Um, there's some things where I'm like, I wouldn't have done this or I wouldn't have told my client to do this. But he walks out of this pretty solidly. And this armor should be in more trouble at the end of the day. All the butts are on her shoulders. Yep. Um, yeah. I Ackles before this was like the guy on Supernatural, that show I never finished. Um, after this, I'm kind of a fan. So I, I kind of like the guy. I'm not really a fan of actors until I see them doing some non-acting things. And yeah, he seems pretty awesome. We gotta keep our mouth shut and we gotta just talk to you guys. But it's it's really frustrating to, to watch the news and have all of those hypotheses reported on. Because I'm just like, come on, lab, yeah. something like give us some hard, give us an unanswered so we can shut everybody up. Well, yeah, I mean, it comes down to that, and then of course, getting um, you know statements from others involved as well. Are you guys having any, any others uh, come in? Um, we still need to interview a lot of people. Oh, really? Pretty much everybody that we can. Um, so I was kind of the, the first one to. Yeah, just to kind of give you, you know, a time span of when you were able to come in according to your schedule. So I wanted to contact you right away and have you pick. So, but I mean, it happened fast and I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, right. yeah really the best for that we can get everyone. And well, what I mean, it is about getting all these, you know, Sarah and Hannah and everybody like, speaking with them again. And, mm -hmm. and starting to get more, questions more answered. detailed questions answered. Right. <clears throat> um, yeah. I want to try to find that text message. Oh, yeah, that would be nice. I, I, I can't. What was it? What was the context of it? It was... Uh, now, to be fair, it they've also cut yeah. them in for a portion of the profits on this one. Rumor or somebody that had actually been a part of that? Do you remember who sent it? It was our costume designer. And it was I guess something that Sarah that said. Did you receive that text message before the incident took place or after? Let's talk about this one. Um, funny, I just noticed the seating. He's backed into a corner. Uh, often you are, although... Um, I'm kind of surprised that they have him back. I think the part of the reason why they have him backed into a corner is that they have two officers, but often when they're just doing a witness interview, they might have you in a more open space backed into a corner is usually suspect position. Um, and usually they'll have it with like a square table so that you're right in the corner. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Somebody saying, well, I heard, or... Yeah, Baldwin is in the same spot. I think it's partially just the camera in here. I don't know if they have multiple cameras, but the camera here is aimed at that spot. So that might be a, a limiting factor here. You can always uh, screenshot and send it to people. Okay. Uh, what's a good way to get hold of you? Any other questions? You got my number, right? Yes, sir, I do. He's got me. I'll see if I can't find it. Because I thought it was... Jensen Ackles, the famous actor, was just like, you've got my number, right? Call me anytime. Um, I can tell you the list of people who have his number is probably pretty small. Um, a lot of people, a lot of like famous actors would be like, you've got my agent's number or whatever. Um, I think that kind of tells us something. He He's very much like, you know what, we're just going to we're going to treat this, you know, he's taking this seriously. Um, I give him props for that. I mean, um, I don't think I, I should be talking to the cops, but, you know, 
um, that, um, props for like again, just I, that I no, feeling on that. I have no reason to believe this or not believe it, but it was just you know you guys are trying to uncover any possibilities. It was uh, um, yeah. Hannah had requested uh, use of the firearms over the weekend to go shooting. It was denied. Uh, it's something about having an email, but then she went ahead and did it anyway and talked to the transport guy, opening up the bus truck and her free access to it, and then taking him out and uh, and doing some dark practice. But then was, I guess, got intoxicated and just putting him back. Or... It's a lot of uh, quite a bit of speculation. It is. Yeah, we haven't had anybody actually come forward and, and say that. specifically say. Yeah, yeah. That, that seemed. I was like, okay, well, that's probably easy to figure out. You go talk to transport, you find out if there was actually a guy that opened the truck for him on the weekend. Um, you, uh, well, even finding that, even if the email, yeah, yeah, find, yeah, find, yeah, somebody find that email, which would have been. I love how now he's transitioned into helping the officers with the in, like, here's how you'd investigate this. Um, this is not a great idea if you are possibly a suspect, but it's still funny to see that. I see Trend Van saying you can change the furniture in the room. I've seen couches and coffee tables used, all depends on the circumstances. This room is actually larger than it looks. Most attachments that I like, most attachments will have multiple rooms. And so most attachments will have like, here's our, you know, hard interview room versus our soft interview room. And the soft interview room is going to be the one with couches and, you know, cushions and all of that. Um, this looks like the hard interview room. So. Uh, props. Um, so we're going to do like Sarah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Watch out. But again, that's not for me. This was just this was kind of a, a, word, of a word of mouth scenario that that came my you know came my way, and I was like, huh, that seems more probable than well, some over a week later we haven't had anybody come forward to to say that. To confirm what was. So then maybe it was just hearsay. Um, any other questions for us? Mm, I don't think so. I put um, my work style in the back of my car. Cool. That way, um, if you have any questions or anything else that we can throw in the other. Um, did you notice he gives his personal cell um, and she gives his work, her work cell. <laughs> I'm just like, that's uh, yeah. And uh, this is probably correct. I don't believe it's a large room. The door is right behind the male officer tight quarters. It almost always is in the hard interview room. These are usually pretty small. Um, so Ian in Canada with no lawyer present for interviews, how do you clean shit up afterwards for your client? Um, not easy if they go and give a statement. Um, yes, we're at one and a half times. So, oh, and Baldwin gave his manager cell. Yep. Uh, it's just kind of interesting to, to note there. Should we talk to Dave or? I saw Dave uh, at the our little memorial thing that we had uh, the day after. Um, and he's, he's a wreck. Um, he was really shook up. I just remember saying, I'm so sorry, man, because I know what happened on his watch. Mm -hmm. And I, I enjoyed working with him. I thought he was good. I thought it was a really good idea. I mean, they, they've got one of the toughest jobs in the industry because they're, it's their set. They're running the set. And they're responsible for so much. Uh, and if something happens like this, they instantly get fingers pointed at them. Um, even if he had never touched the gun, he still would be, uh, he, he still would be getting fingers pointed at because he's the, he's the guy, it's his set. He's running the safety of that set. And... I just remember saying to him that I'm, I'm just so sorry, man, that this happened to him because he, he uh, my experience with him was, was a very this positive. is just him wanting um, to talk. And I, I, didn't, I don't like seeing stuff. Like the why the reason why he wants to talk is because this is emotionally stressful, right? It's emotionally difficult. And um, so this is why it's dangerous to be in this room is that, you know, if you have been in a stressful situation, um, you're going to want to talk and it's, um, it's difficult. It's troublesome. So, um, a lot of people get themselves into trouble with this. People are asking how long did this interview go? Not much longer. Um, a little bit. Sounds like good people. Right. It sounds like you didn't have a negative experience with anybody on set though. Uh, no, besides, pretty amicable. <laughs> besides, well, besides yours, one cameraman. Um, yeah, but even still, I tried to, I tried to be nice and make friends with him just because I thought maybe he needed, you know, Need somebody nice in his life. I don't know. Uh, I, I really love what I do. I really enjoy being upset. I mean, I think I told you this over the phone. I was, I was pretending to act like Clint Eastwood, but inside I was like really six years old. I was so excited to be able to play cowboy and ride horses and shoot guns. I mean, growing up in Texas, in Dallas, and I'm sure uh, 
the Cowboys watched it. That game was pretty good last night. So they're looking good. I know. Um, I mean, that would be cool. Out. But I mean, you know, I, I this was a this was a dream for me to do a Western, and so I was just super excited to be there. And was having a ton of fun with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to other people it was just a job. It was just a paycheck, but not to a lot of us. To a lot of us, this was, this was something really unique and fun. I mean, even Alec had said, "He's like, I've never done a Western. I always wanted to do one. It's awesome." Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of a lot of us that felt felt that way. Um, so if I saw somebody that was just kind of like, uh, I just tried to turn on. You know, like, it's the problem, man. We're out. It's beautiful in this weather. It's the sky. We're shooting a Western. Exactly. Get over yourself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I was having. I, I, I had a pretty fun experience. Like, I would have said like, he should have had legal representation, but he didn't. Um, this happened on a variety of levels. I mean, that we lost a, a, an incredible talent, and uh, it's at one and a half speed. Sound. Um, but also that we all lost this. We all lost this movie together. So we're mourning that too, which is tough to, on a variety of levels. I mean, part of me wanted to just come back just to like, like I, I think I'm going to try to go out to the ranch today. I just want to like say goodbye, I guess. I mean, he's he's broken up. It's um, it's sad, right? Um, and he's still sort of processing it. Um, now they didn't lose the movie because at the end of the day, they, um, what do you call it? They're going to continue filming it. So, um, that'll be interesting, but yeah, you see, even if you're completely innocent, have an inter or have attorney, uh, do we have access to AD Dave's interview? I haven't looked over it, but I'll see if I can find it to do a, a review of this. So yeah. Runkle. Hi. <laughs> All right difficult for many people there. I mean, it was hard even that day to interview, you know? A lot of people were just so emotional. And Well, that day, certainly, I mean, that's, that's like that kind of initial trauma emotion of, of experiencing something that's, you know... And now it's that moving on from it. But now it's, yeah, it's the, yeah. it's the how do I compartmentalize this now? He's pretty you know, stoic, but now it's starting life. to break. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, um, I think I'm, I'm on schedule to next week, or this week. So, we'll see how that goes. It might be a clusterfuck. <laughs> I don't know if I need to unpack it with a stranger, but, uh, but it's weird, too, like, going home, like I said, like, my wife is, you know, she's... she's She's emotional about it. So I'm sure in her mind she's thinking, what if that was you? That, and also that we had an eight-year-old. And that there was a nine-year-old kid who lost his mom. Yeah. That's the hard part is being able to not personalize something, really, especially when it's so close to you. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to play what if, because that gun was about to point at me in a scene, you know? And was I about to get in a firefight with Alec Baldwin and we were shooting live rounds? Right. Were we about to, like, Swiss cheese each other? Fuck. That's why I'm like... Can you imagine that feeling of like not being sure if you were about to, um, you know, if you were about to die or, you know, whatever else? Um, that's a rough feeling. In due time, we'll yeah. have hopefully every question answered but it does you know no I no i know it takes time we still don't have an answer to this one well, i was like oh, you need me out here for to help it move the move the needle anyway i'm on my way thank you for being here yeah, definitely thanks for uh thanks for taking this on i know this is probably a, a monster for you guys um you guys need me i'm on my way i mean he's practically being a cowboy right here um but thank you no thank, thank you, you for doing what you I'll let you enjoy your day. I mean, I'll, I'm for the rancher, and there's probably out there you might be able to. I'll yeah, let you enjoy your day. I can. I'll let you enjoy your day. I can guarantee you, he's not going on to enjoy his day. Um, he's going to go home and uh, have a real hard think. Um, yeah. Clear security. Yeah, I know they're still working on their last week. Go so. walk the property. Yeah. Because yeah. hey, there's another film I think filming somewhere else. Yeah. On the ranch as well. Which was, was quite good. Okay. All right. Do you have any questions or anything? Give us a call, man. I really I appreciate will. you coming out and, and doing it so quickly. Yeah. No, again, I, I, you know, I want to get this ball rolling. So that's it. Um, Wow, right? I mean, you know, you can see the dangers of talking to police. And even though it worked out for, for Ackles, right? He didn't get charged because there's nothing to charge him with, right? There's just nothing to 
tag him with overall. So, um, yeah, it's just, um, you know, he ends up being safe on that, but there's potentially situations where uh, people do get, um, you know, do get charged on this. And the thing is, is that the police don't necessarily, you know, you don't necessarily know how they're going to react to this. Because sometimes you see things where people are, where the police are like, oh, this guy was too helpful. So that made us suspicious. What was he hiding? Because he's so helpful. There's always danger with with that. Um, but, I mean, he comes, he really is the only guy who comes out of this uh, looking like he's kind of solid, right? Because he's... He comes out of this just being like, I'm here. I'm honest. I want to, I want to help. Um, you know, I, he's just sad. Right. But yeah. And this is a really great comment here. Um, the rest of us aren't Jensen Ackles. Shut up and lawyer up. Absolutely. Um, and you know, what happens if Hannah Gutierrez Reed says later, you know who I think put, you know, these live rounds on that. I think Jensen Ackles did, you know, and if she says that, then now he's potentially in the soup and all of this interview might be used against him potentially. So, um, yeah, it's, um, it's tough, right? So, um, I, I think that this is, um, this is, you know, it's not great that he's doing this interview, but he doesn't do anything wrong in the interview to the extent that, you know, so yeah, if you are the victim of a crime, should you also lawyer up? Potentially, um, it is possible. I mean, it can never hurt to talk to a lawyer. The lawyer, you might talk to them and the lawyer might say, you don't need me, right? I've had lots of people call me and say, um, you know, and I said, you don't need me. So that is very much a thing. Uh, Gareth Dean, I actually have always meant to ask. Lots of police interviews from America are available on various YouTube channels, but never ones with lawyers present. Typically, the lawyer keeps it from being interesting because if you have a lawyer present, typically the lawyer shuts the interview down. Uh, there are a few exceptions. There's the Murdoch trial where he had an, a lawyer present. That lawyer did not a whole lot for him in that interview and oh right how'd that work out for Murdoch? he's going to oh it's not yale it reminds it rhymes with yale yeah um you know maybe don't do the interviews there uh did they question his inconsistency live round should never be on set then why does he drive fire um i mean Nobody should ever be in the crosswalk when I have a green light, but I still check before I turn because people do things, you know, you check. This is what safety rules are about is to be safe even when stuff is, um, you know, even when, you know, even though something should not be a problem. Um, do lawyers ever do free consultations? I'd usually shy away because of the cost. There are usually lawyers out there who do free consultations, but, uh, or inexpensive consultations. So, um, yeah. See, that's because his lawyer was uh, sleeping with his shirt unbuttoned in the back seat. He was unhelpful. Um, I kind of feel like if you were, like if his lawyer was awake, um, he might actually have stepped in. So, yeah, um, this is such a, a weird case, right? And what we saw at the beginning of this one is that Baldwin now has a very viable argument that might get this whole thing thrown out. Um, and that bothers me. But um, yeah, it we're, um, I'm going to still go through, there's other interviews that I haven't gone through yet, so I still plan to go through them. Um, but yeah, we'll just, um, we'll do that over time. Um, I see that lawyer was disbarred. Yep. That's a happy ending out of that. Um, and the police or court transcripts can change one word and it leads to wrongful conviction. It happens. Um, a could versus could not. Yep. Somebody mishears it and gets the wrong thing into the transcript. It happens. Um, 
So, uh, I haven't been watching the Zachariah Anderson case, so I'd have to start looking into that. But, um, all right, um, we'll wrap this up here. I've been at this for a fair while. Uh, so if you have any last minute questions, you better hit me with those right now before I head out. Um, tomorrow I'm going to be watching the Paltrow, uh, trial. I'll do another recap at the end. We'll also do some, uh, you know, Friday fun talking. Um, I will definitely be going through the Afro man stuff as well. Whoops. Um, Afro man. We will definitely talk about that. I've got a whole lot of opinions, so many opinions. Um, yeah. So join me tomorrow. Um, also, if you're not a subscriber to Roll of Law, uh, I that is my other channel. I am doing something fun over there. Um, I'm doing uh, a contest to give away 10 silver coins, which is a value of little under, I think the current value is a little under 400 bucks Canadian. So a fair chunk of change overall. Um, yeah, uh, tomorrow's Monday. We're going to be, I'm going to be doing Monday, uh, Monday fun day stuff. So um, I don't have any of the fun, inappropriate books. I don't have any of that stuff, but I will cover some of that uh, sort of stuff there. So um, yeah, check out the um, check out the Roll of Law. Check out uh, the stream uh, later tomorrow night. Uh, I'm going to try to get some sleep, but yes, Terry Sanderson, Colonel Sanderson, um, is supposed to be up first thing. It tomorrow's Monday. Yes, I need to get more sleep. Um, and I'm not going to get some sleep, but I'm going to pretend that I'm going to get some sleep. Uh, love or hate the supernatural storyline. At least they had quality safety on set. Yep. Nobody got hurt. Nobody got, uh, nobody died. It's, you know, that's kind of the, the standard here. So, um, can we call it Monday mischief? I like that. Uh, Monday mischief. It might have to be. All right. I'm going to roll the, uh, the outro here and, uh, see you guys tomorrow. Thank you.